Okay. Um, well, we're a couple minutes after. Should we go ahead and get started and do um, we do housekeeping first. stuff first? Yeah, Shannon, I think you're going to do the housekeeping, right? Today? Yes. Welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Rules Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We'll, we will begin shortly. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad and star nine again to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. discussion. New going forward, all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. For those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, Holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. While joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. I mean, would you like me to do roll call vote? Thank you, yes, that'd be great. Come on. Great. Al Saraf? Present. Fightmaster Bennett. Present. Blakemore. Present. Rochelle. Present. Connolly. Here. Meeker. Here. Judge Seligman. We have quorum. I'll do um, lays on the state bar staff. Selena. I'm here. I'm making tea. I'm here though. Oh, no problem. Body, I don't see body, I see Melody. Hi. And then state bar staff, we have Erica, Dan, Shannon, and Brady. The kids yep. here. Okay, great. I'll turn it back to you, uh, Amin, for public comments. Okay, great. Do we have any uh, public comment today? We just, um, there's Zach Newman from LAC is um, online also. Okay. But He's there's back. no one else. No one else? Okay. Um, then let's let's move into the uh, the consent item on the agenda, which is the meeting minutes from the February meeting. <clears throat> Does anyone have any comments or edits or changes to it? Okay, hearing none. Do we have a motion? Um, I'll move. All right, second. Catherine seconds. Okay. Erica Catherine. moves, Catherine seconds, I'll do roll call. Um, Al Saraf? Yes. Fightmaster Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, great. All right, let's 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 jump into the um, the first item under uh, the, the substantive items on the agenda, which is the approval of recommendations related to processing client complaints from legal aid grantees. We had Will and Pamela on that in that working group, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And um, and Erica is the uh, the staff. Who right? Who from staff was on this on this one? I didn't see. Is that Erica? I was. Yeah. Yeah. Erica, yeah. Oh, great. All right. So I'll turn it over to you guys to, to present to the group. Great. Thank you. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, Sorry, my PowerPoint's um, stalled. Okay. So um, we'll be talking about uh, addressing complaints from the public against state bar funded grant recipients. Um, as Amin mentioned, the working group from the Rules Committee um, on this topic was Pamela and Will. So 
Pam and Will, feel free to jump in as I go through this. Um, and if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, so I'll just go through quickly some of the governing authorities, uh, the current rule and office practice in terms of implementing that rule, uh, the considerations that the working group had when um, thinking of ways to update or improve it, uh, the original recommendation that went out, uh, feedback that we received from the legal aid community, and then um, some time for discussion about the proposal. So the main governing authority regarding complaints comes from the state bar rule 3.692. Um, it addresses complaints um, in terms of who can file them, how they come through uh, the state bar and um, how to resolve them all the way up you know, from the staff level through the commission. Um, this rule also incorporates any other applicable governing authorities. So it um, sort of collectively refers to the trust fund requirements, uh, which would be inclusive of the IOLTA statute, um, other state bar rules in this section, uh, the standards for the provision of civil legal aid, which under the statute is the state bar's quality control guidelines for grantees, um, grant agreements, any, any of those uh, documents or, or rules that um, grantees would need to abide by um, in order to remain compliant with uh, their grant requirements. Um, so examples of complaints that could come in under this rule um, would be things like alleging that a grantee was using the wrong income eligibility threshold, um, that they are charging indigent clients and not reporting that on their grant applications, um, failure to have sort of an internal grievance policy or procedure that um, say a client who um, is um, dissatisfied with service could use to um, go up the chain of command to um, address their concerns. Um, so those are just examples of uh, complaints that could be brought to the commission um, from a member of the public uh, alleging non-compliance with um, grant requirements. Um, this typically wouldn't include um, instances of individual attorney misconduct, um, but it was noted in uh, the memorandum that, you know, if there was an implication that the grantee was not providing su sufficient supervision, that might be something that could be investigated, but individual attorney misconduct, generally speaking, will be referred to the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel of the State Bar. Um, another issue that typically wouldn't be reviewed through the complaints process is dissatisfaction with level of service. So, um, you know, grantees are not required to provide uh, clients with a specific level of service. They may need to make certain decisions about you know, whether they can provide representation or help somebody in pro per. And um, typically we wouldn't, um, you know, the state bar and the commission would not get involved in those sort of internal decisions. But if they didn't have a grievance policy, that would be something that um, could be investigated. So under the rule, um, when a complaint is lodged, the three possible outcomes are to dismiss the complaint. The commission can require corrective action of the grantee if there is an issue. Um, or the most serious outcome under the current rule would be termination of funding um, with a right to appeal to state bar court. Um, uh, Erica. Yes. Delina, I mean, she might have a clarifying question here. Her mm -hmm. hand up. Oh, great. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, no, it's, it's fine. I, I also, it's, we share your screen. It's often hard to see the hands. Um, we got a client complaint this morning and I was curious how it would fall in the state bar system of somebody who is mad that the organization wouldn't serve them. Um, and from what I can tell, I, we get these every once in a while, from what I can tell, it's actually not a legal aid issue. Mm -hmm. So how would you address if, if a person said, you know, so-and-so legal aid organization won't sue a community college? Um, would you dismiss it outright? Would you investigate? How do you, how do you deal with those kinds of complaints? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, when a complaint comes in, even if it's not um, relevant under, uh, if it's not something that the commission could take action on, staff would still work with the complainant to facilitate a dialogue with the grantee, um, but would ultimately explain to the complainant why we don't think that this is um, something that the commission could make a decision on, that you can't force them to take that type of case, for example. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, under the current rule, um, sort of the process is that a formal written complaint has to be lodged with state bar staff. Um, state bar staff would investigate and attempt an informal resolution between the complainant and the grantee. Um, there's a 90 day timeline on that. Uh, if there is no resolution, then a report would have to be um, presented to the commission with a recommendation from staff about how to resolve it. Um, and then the commission would have to review the report um, and any responses from either the complainant and or the grantee. Um, there isn't a fixed timeline on that. It just says within a reasonable time. Um, and the commission would then have the option of dismissing or having a conference. Um, and then at the conference, if there is one, um, there's the option, those three options to dismiss, have corrective action or terminate funding. Um, the dismissal would be final. Um, actually, this is a mistake in the, in the PowerPoint. Corrective action, actually, it doesn't say in the rule currently whether it's final or not. It just says dismissals are final. And then if termination of funding occurs, that there's a right to appeal to state bar court. So um, it's actually silent about the corrective action piece. It just says the commission can require that, but it doesn't say whether there's um, the ability to appeal that. So. Um, so for as far as current practice um, in implementing the rule, um, you know, there's infrequent application of this rule. We noted that there's a very small number of complaints that actually come through the Office of Access and Inclusion each year. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's fewer than five. Um, so this issue comes up, but it, it's not a frequently recurring issue. Um, the, the rule requires a formal written complaint. Our office practice has been to accept email um, complaints. Um, occasionally, we'll take a complaint over the phone and, and put it on paper and go over it with the, the complainant if necessary. Um, we endeavor to reach an informal resolution. Um, but uh, some of the issues that staff has come across with the rule is that it's somewhat unclear about how to determine if it's been resolved, whether um, you know, that has to be an affirmative agreement by everyone. That's how we've treated it, is um, if we have a proposal about how to close things out, that we need to get an affirmative agreement from the parties. Um, but that can be difficult to obtain. Occasionally, complainants um, are hard to reach or may drop off at some point. And um, so in the absence of uh, clear language on that, that has been our approach. Um, but it may be pushing complaints through the process that might not need to proceed. Um, and then the other main issue with the rule has been that the timelines are quite vague um, and could pose the potential for complaints to sort of sit for a long time without um, getting finality. So. Um, so when the working group first was addressing this topic, um, some of the considerations they had in mind when wanting to make updates to the rule um, and improve this process were, you know, they spent some time thinking about the purpose of the complaints process and, you know, this list is by no means exhaustive, but some of the things that came up were making sure that there is, you know, accountability from grantees um, in carrying out their obligations under the grant. Um, looking for process improvement, both on the side of grantees, as well as, you know, within the state bar and the commission, making sure that um, it's an efficient and effective process if a complaint needs to be lodged. Um, having fairness in the grant making process um, and making sure calculation of grant awards are correct. Um, protecting clients or prospective clients of grantees and then um, when a complainant lodges a complaint, making sure they have an opportunity to to participate in the process. Um, some other considerations were transparency. So making sure that any person reading the rule would understand what the process should look like um, if they are unfamiliar with it or new, um, particularly in the case of complainants who might not know if it's appropriate to file a complaint um, or how they would do so, that this should be transparent for them, um, as well as setting everybody's expectations about what kind of timeline um, and uh, processes are gonna be implemented. So um, another consideration was efficiency. So wanting to move these complaints along as quickly as possible, but making sure that there is a level of oversight that's being provided that um, you know any issues that arise can be addressed. Um, as I said, making the process accessible to members of the public was a big priority as well, um, because this 
processes for them, um, specifically for uh, the public to lodge complaints. Um, there was also an emphasis on promoting collaboration and problem solving. So the working group did not want to view this process as primarily punitive. Um, it's meant to encourage um, compliance with grant requirements and to um, invite, you know, if there is an issue for grantees to collaborate in, in solving the problem, um, addressing it quickly and moving, uh, moving on. So, um, and then there was also a desire to have more kind of incremental steps for escalating before going immediately to full commission review. Um, so based on those considerations, the working group's preliminary recommendations were to clarify the timelines throughout both for staff um, and for the commission. Um, also to encourage early resolution, um, build, build in um, off ramps, if you will. So there's, uh, if you've looked at the proposed rule, um, options to try to resolve it at various stages throughout the complaints process. So it could come staff level if everybody's in agreement. Um, if it goes up to the next intermediate level, which I'll talk about in a second about the advisory committee, it could be resolved at that level if, you know, upon reflection, everybody is in agreement and um, feels that, you know, it's been a fair uh, process and the recommendation um, is fine. Um, and then, you know, obviously, ultimately reaching the full commission if necessary. Um, but th uh, that kind of led to the recommendation for this intermediate step of a two-person advisory committee, because the rule is currently written, it goes from staff to the commission um, or a committee appointed by the commission. Um, but having this two-person advisory group, um, the thought was that it would allow uh, the commission to conserve resources by having two individuals kind of look at this issue more in depth um, and to engage with the parties, both the complainant and the grant recipient. Um, to be able to do that in an informal setting um, and take the time needed to review. Um, you know, it was noted in the memo that uh, if it goes to the commission or even a committee, um, that it would be part of a publicly noticed hearing. And some of these issues, you know, they may, some of these complaints may ultimately be resolved through a dismissal. And so, you know, there was a question about whether it needs to take up significant commission time resources and be in a publicly noticed hearing if it's eventually going to be considered a non-issue. Um, and then, uh, but then to, to have that um, requirement that it will go to the full commission if there is no agreement. So there is still that oversight um, and the ultimate decision maker would be the full commission. So it, their outcome would be in the form of a recommendation, um, not, a, not a final decision. Um, there was also recommendation to remove any reference to termination of funding in the rule. Um, there are provisions in the current rule that are redundant of another rule. Um, and so the recommendation was if the potential non-compliance was so serious that it would rise to the level of, you know, potentially terminating funding, that that should just be handled through that process, which is in rule 3.691. So, um, the recommendation was to to then refer it over to let the provisions of 691 control in that instance. Um, and then uh, another minor update was to allow for um, service and exchange of information uh, through email uh, to make it basically to comply with current practice and to make things um, more easy and efficient for the parties. Um, and then there was the recommendation, which is not part of the rule itself, but to encourage um, state bar staff to create an online complaint reporting page to, again, facilitate access to um, the complaints process for the public. So, so the legal aid community um, was provided with a draft of the memorandum and the initial proposed rule um, a few weeks ago. and. Um, Lack shared that with the community and obtained their feedback and provided comments. Um, and I know Selena and Zach are on the call. So if you have anything you wanna add about this, um, please feel free. But um, the takeaways for the working group were that the community was mostly supportive of the, the recommendations and the desire to make this process efficient and accessible. Um, and so some of the main points of feedback though, um, the area where there was uh, sort of the, the most um, 
disagreement or divergence um, in terms of what the working group proposed versus the community was um, that the community was strongly opposed to the idea of allowing um, anonymous complaints. So there had been mentioned in the original memo that if staff is going to create this reporting page, if there's the possibility of anonymous complaints, that there needs to be a disclaimer for, um, you know, whether that complaint can really progress because um, we may not be able to, staff may not be able to follow up or gather more information. Um, so in reference to that suggestion, the community was, as far as I understand it, pretty unanimously opposed to allowing anonymous complaints. Um, and they provided several reasons for that, including that, uh, you know, members of the public or opposing parties have used uh, processes like anonymous complaints or online reviews to harass um, legal aid organizations um, and to draw resources away from providing services because they need to respond to these um, complaints. It's also difficult, even if it were um, for a legitimate purpose that the complaint was lodged. Uh, but right it's hard for organizations to follow up if they, they don't know who to identify or who to, to contact to provide assistance. Um, so that was the, I believe, sort of the crux of that um, disagreement on that point. Um, the community also emphasized the need to inform complainants of the potential effects of lodging their complaints. So um, as noted, staff receives most complaints from either current clients or former clients or individuals who are attempting to access services through a legal services organization. And so there was, um, it was really more of a point of feedback and clarification with staff that, um, you know, staff already has the practice of um, letting clients know that uh, they may need to waive their right to confidentiality. And um, if we were to create a, a page that this would be information that's provided up front before they even, you know, file the complaint with us. Um, and there was also an emphasis on accessibility, so um, making sure that the any website created would be language accessible in a variety of languages, um, using clear, plain language on the reporting page as well. Um, and then I believe there was also a, a request for clarity about how an organization might be implicated when, let's say, a referral is made to the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel about an individual attorney. And so um, that goes back to what I was saying about if, if there's an indication that an organization knew or should have known about that person's misconduct um, and was not providing sufficient supervision, that could be an example of, of where there may be overlap between the two um, processes. So um, I don't know if it's helpful. I had... Um, I know it's in your memorandum, but um, I had highlighted parts of the suggested updates to the rule just to kind of point out what the changes are. Um, I don't know if that's the best use of time, but I can run through them quickly if people would find that helpful. But... Okay, well, hearing... Selena has her hand up. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just to give a tiny bit of extra information on the, the community feedback, um, Erica is right. Everyone was largely in support of all of the suggested um, edits to the process, and everyone liked the idea of having um, a smaller advisory group, at least from those we heard back from. Everybody liked the idea of having a smaller advisory group to kind of aid with quick resolution. Um, I know a couple of people were concerned about having co client complaints open for a very long time because they may have to report it to funders. And so they also felt that, that a way to expedite the process, especially for complaints that staff, state of our staff thinks are not meritorious would be really helpful. Um, and so that's why I was asking, because I literally just got a client complaint maybe 20 minutes before I got on. Um, and I looked into the materials, I realized that there was no actual reason for it to be a complaint. And so I was curious how much time that takes of state bar staff when you kind of know based on past years that this is not gonna go anywhere and how much resources, staff resources have to be spent um so but but overall community liked all the suggested changes the anonymous piece was really interesting because i heard um you know from many organizations who reached out to me not on the listserv um or not to you know reply all to other eds but saying that they had gotten a lot of complaints that they suspected were from opposing parties who were like bad mm -hmm. reviews complaints to the better business bureau um and it, at least from what they told me all of them were without merit that they were um, parties who were mad in domestic violence situations. Whenever someone had gotten a TRO against them, 
they did not like that. And so they went to Yelp or Google reviews or even the Better Business Bureau. Um, some organizations who, who target their services for particular communities, meaning people who have language access issues or otherwise hard to reach, um, because they target their services to particular areas, they had had people say, oh, you're not helping me because I'm not X, Y, Z, um, which is not the reason. It was that they actually didn't have a, a, a legal right. claim. Right. Um, but it's really interesting the type of complaints they, they saw. And they were really worried that if there were an anonymous um, complaint process, that it would somehow be searchable, like Better Business Bureau, Bureau or um, that it would somehow reflect poorly on the organization and also waste staff time. Um, when they actually had no merit. But I, I think that at least from what I heard from people, the, the LSC portal seemed to be a, a middle ground where I know that there may be current clients or former clients who have a, a valid complaint and they don't want to give all of their information. But um, our community felt that at least State Bar staff needed to be able to reach them for clarifying right, questions. Right, 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 and right. at least some opportunity for due process to say, you know, in November of 2021, this is what happened in your ex office. Right. Um, because otherwise, if you don't have dates or locations, right. the organization right. can't figure out if it was one person doing something bad or if it was a, a whole office policy. Right. Um, but the LSE process, um, you know, they do allow confidential reports where LSE staff can investigate, but that information is not given fully to the organization. So that was that was just feedback on that. Thank you. Um, Erica Will has his hand up too. Okay. Um, I just, uh, I have a, a lot of thoughts on that, but the only piece that I think is, is relevant is uh, at this moment is that we were, after we got all the feedback, or at least I'll speak for myself, mm -hmm. I felt like we would want a little more um, transparency in that piece where we receive a complaint and it's dismissed. Uh, either because it's not meritorious, it's not really within our, our jurisdiction, and we don't have that in the language, though I imagine it it's, um, would still take place. But maybe it's, it's better to wait till after Erica's done and I can talk more about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, sort of as currently, proposed if we had a complaint that doesn't seem meritorious the way it's written um, staff couldn't just outright dismiss it um, but to answer I think Selena's you know initial question about sort of how to expedite that process you know if the investigation yields or even just on its face it doesn't seem meritorious and there is some follow-up from staff with the grantee I don't know if it would need to take a huge amount of time and resources because even though the timeline is that staff has 90 days to try to resolve this that doesn't mean we need to take all 90 days so um if we if, if we know sooner than that that it's um you know not meritorious shouldn't proceed we would recommend dismissal that we could kind of advance that pretty quickly um granted the way it is written currently it would still need to kind of go through those steps so potentially we would need to convene the advisory uh body but recommend dismissal and then if they also think it should be dismissed like we can try to move that along the the time limits that are proposed are kind of like more of the outer bounds not that we have to take up that entire time period um so it doesn't need to kind of linger too long um pamela then kathleen sure no i just wanted to comment and that process will still be in writing so it wouldn't, like she was just saying, it wouldn't just be um, out there and not dealt with, but whatever the decision was, it would still be in written form on record. So whenever that issue came up again, we can say, hey, we did resolve or attempted to resolve. This is how we did it. These are the number of ways we intended um, to attempt to reach someone and wasn't able to. So there was something definitely in writing to confirm that entire process. I think I think Pamela was asking something similar to what I was asking of someone may file a complaint, there may not be a lot of information, and then the person can't be reached um, to gather additional information. And it seems at some point, then, you know, just as, as fairness to the program that 
you, mm -hmm. you have to make a decision about whether you have enough information to proceed after you've tried to reach the person X number of times. And if not, you know, notify the person maybe in writing the complaints being dismissed, absent them getting in touch with you. And if not, just proceed yeah. with the dismissal, not letting it just hang on, I think. So yes. Um, and that is how sort of the new recommended process would work. Um, that at the point where staff is ready to propose a resolution, um, rather than requiring the affirmative agreement of all parties, we would present our, you know, recommended outcome and then the grantee and or the complainant would need to object to the recommended resolution. Otherwise, within you know a certain period of time, it can it can be closed out. So in the case of if somebody becomes unresponsive, um, I would think based on the way it's um, currently presented that if they're not objecting, that it could be assumed that they are fine with the dismissal if that's the recommendation. But. I mean, did you want to go? Yeah, Eric, I had a quick question just procedurally on that point. In the event that either um, the grant recipient or the complainant objects to the proposed resolution, does that, whatever they say in their objection, is that something that is provided to, the, to each side? Or is it sort of, because the way I read it was sort of like the objection goes to the state bar and the state bar prepares kind of a, a report. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of benefit to, or, or maybe not, to sharing that with each other or with everybody when the, when the objection comes in? Yeah, that's a, um, right. I don't think that's built in. I think as a matter of practice, staff, you know, again, throughout this process would kind of be an intermediary going back and forth between the complainant and the grantee. So um, it could end up being like a never ending process. Right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. To respond and, you know, so I, I, I can see the value in maybe limiting that, but. And they would. Um, so, for example, if um, let's say the complainant uh, objected to staff's resolution because staff thinks it should be dismissed. Um, then staff would prepare the report for the advisory body. Both the complainant and the grantee would get a copy of that report, and then they have the opportunity to file kind of their um, additional information or to articulate their objections, and then everybody would have access to that information. So they would um, have the opportunity to you know, present kind of their side of things um, as well through that step. Thank you. Um, Duan, are there any other hands okay. raised? Okay. okay, great. Um, so I'll just quickly kind of run through the proposed rule. What's highlighted is not necessarily the only changes, but kind of like the main points to because I've spoken generally about what the goals were with changing the rule, but um, just to highlight where those changes are coming in. So um, this first slide is just about allowing um, electronic service and exchange of uh, documents. Um, but in recognition of the fact that, um, you know, uh, individuals may not have easy access to email, it's not a foregone conclusion that email is acceptable, we would need the recipient's consent, but that this will become kind of the, the default, um, otherwise, uh, the default practice using using email. Um, so. um, and then subsection B of the rule um, clarifies the timelines, as I was saying, so staff will have 10 days um, to share the complaint with the grant recipient once it's received. Um, as we were just talking about that staff can propose a resolution and it would be um, the responsibility of the grant recipient or the complainant to object um, if they disagree with the proposed resolution. Otherwise that will become the, the final outcome or decision. Um, and then it also clarifies the timeline for staff that the 90 days that's in the current rule, that's the outer limit. So staff's report has to be filed within 90 days, not that we can allow 90 days to run and then file the report sometime after that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're sort of recommending um, 
placing this intermediate step of allowing the co-chairs to designate a two member advisory body um, when the complaint's gonna move past the staff level. How do you define days? <clears throat> are those business days or those calendar actual days? days? Calendar, calendar days. Calendar days? Mm -hmm. So yep. like if they file a complaint on December 25th, you got to solve it within 10 days? No, you have to share it with the grantee within 10 days, but then you have three months to attempt to resolve it. I mean, yeah, that would be um, probably around the holidays would probably be the most challenging time, but I think that's why 10 days is a more reasonable option um, in terms of having, you know, in the event of being having the office be closed or something like that, that there's still sufficient time to provide that, to share that information. Erica and Catherine, I can't, I can't remember yeah. the word. Um, this is sort of a random question, but I noticed that for, I think it's on the A, that electronic, <clears throat> that receipt will be the timestamp mm -hmm. of the sender. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, this may not matter because there's maybe sufficient timing, but I just wanted, was curious if that aligns with like court rules on electronic delivery um, or whether there's any like, you know, cause like mail, you get like five extra days and I can't remember mm -hmm. if under the court rules, you get like two days or something under electronic delivery. But the only reason I asked that is, for example, if we have individuals who may not have easy access to, you know, a computer or something, obviously it's with their consent, but um, just something, I was just curious. If um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, sorry. Um, I can look it up while we're doing no, it. It's fine. Know. I was going to say, while you all are discussing, I'm happy to go look that up, but I, I don't know. I'll take care of it. It's my question. No, sorry. no it's fine. Um, Catherine had question so i guess so the attempt to resolve and mm -hmm. then if you it so the attempt to resolve is sort of at the end of the sentence of when you're putting it i, I it's just a structure question it seems like you're saying within 10 days this is going to happen and then there's after that happens after you've notified people additional steps are going to happen one of which is resolution and if not resolution then kind of this investigation that you do so i'm really just wondering like and and attempt to resolve the complaint that i mean it's not happening within the 10 days because you have up to 90 days to do all of that it's just a structural question within b of should there just be a sentence that says you're going to do it within 10 days and then within 90 days you're going to do these other things mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I could see that. Anyway, it's just for clarification, because when I first read it, I'm like, well, you're not resolving it. You're not attempting to resolve it within 10 days. And it doesn't really say that, but they're two separate thoughts, I think. Notification, yeah. the right, steps you're right. taking to get an, a, a resolution. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I guess you could you could split it into a subsection or else move it up and, and what Catherine suggested within within night. Yeah, I think you could do it. I think it, it's yeah, I just think I anyway, however you want to do it, it just I it just struck me as a little unclear. Okay. Brady, do you have a suggestion on the on the fly for that comment? Are we saying we would sorry? It's just to make it more clear. I don't Catherine, you're not disagreeing. We just want to for clarity, right? I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I might say like you could have a subsection one, you're going to provide a copy within that days. And then second, within 90 days, you're going to do the following things, which is attempt to resolve it um, or make a determination. I mean, because if you result, right, I, anyway, how, whatever that next step is, it's just to be clear, it's a separate step from the notification. Because mm -hmm. the yeah, resolution now is tied to the first you're giving notice. Right. So I'd, I'd put a period for sure after 10 days right. and then start the next thought within 90 days, the staff is either going to resolve it or come up with a you know, proposed resolution, right? So you're not saying strike anything, just clarify the two sections. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Thank you for the clarity, Will. 
<laughs> Fingers <laughs> crossed this time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it makes sense to maybe revise that, um, you know, a little bit. Um, sure. Pamela and Erica have their hands raised. Pamela, go ahead. Okay, my point would just be to just say respond to the complainant within 10 days to acknowledge that it was received. And then like Catherine was saying, then the next 90 day will be the full um, resolution and all that on all those details. But just please say within 10 days we'll respond to complaint it that we did receive your um, complaint. No, that we and then we're moving forward after that. All right. I think, you know, if we were to come create a or reporting page that we can build in sort of like an automatic notice of receipt for the complainant so that they know that we have received it. Um, it's just a matter of then communicating that or passing it on to the to the grantee. Erica, do you want to go next? Uh, I just had like <laughs> I just had like an update on my electronic service comment, which is like not related to what we're talking about. I can either say that now or I can wait and, and say it later. Go for it. Okay, so I'll just note, we don't have to change this, but I'll just note that under the civil, the code of civil procedure, if you do electronic service, you get two extra days on your deadlines. So yes, it is deemed like, you know, mailed at the time of the timestamp, but like, any deadline is extended by two days. So I, I only just posit that it may not matter given the timing here, um, but I don't know whether that applies in the mail context, but just wanted to provide that as information. Um, yes, I think elsewhere in the rules and in the state bar rules, I think the mailing context was five days, so. Um, okay. And maybe in the state bar rules, the electronic service also already has, like it's already described somewhere else. I just wanted to flag it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I mean, I think if others are supportive of that, you know, that could also be an update. Um, yeah. Hey, um... Hmm. Can I chime in? <laughs> um, I just wanna say that's a really interesting point. I think most of the deadlines apply to staff, but I'd have to go through and, and make sure, uh, cause I think it would be fine to change cause email is not a perfect uh, medium and having a little uh, leeway there seem, certainly seems sensible. And on Catherine's suggestion, I think we should look at it, but maybe if we can finish the presentation and go back and look, because I also have an item that I want to amend and it might somewhere fit in here. Okay. That was my suggestion at the at the moment. Yeah, I'm um, I'm sort of writing down some of the suggestions and then maybe at some point in the discussion, if if there is a desire to make text edits, I can bring up like a Word document for and we can do that, so. Um, okay, were there any other hands raised? No? Okay. Um, so then uh, the next sort of edit um, or update was, um, it was all, already the practice or always, already the requirement that if staff you know, has to submit a report to the commission that both the complainant and the grant recipient would um, be provided a copy of that um, and have an opportunity to submit a response to it. Um, the update here is that, you know, if a complainant asks staff for assistance, that staff would assist them in preparing a, a written response. Um, so that's an option for complainants who may have a need um, in that respect. Um, subsection D, the main update here is, um, again, putting a timeline. There used to be, I think the current version of the rule says within a reasonable time, 
um, the, the recommended update was to put a timeline of 120 days on um, this intermediate step of the advisory body review. So um, within that time period that uh, the advisory body would either you know, make a recommendation of dismissal or have an informal conference um, with the complainant and the grantee um, just to, in order to kind of keep things uh, moving along. Um, and then again, um, as described to the advisory body, uh, the outcome of that um, process would be the form of a recommendation of the commission. So the advisory body can recommend dismissal, recommend corrective action, um, or um, recommend that there be consideration of the complaint under rule 3.691, which is the rule that deals with termination of funding. So that would be in the case of a very serious violation or not compliance uh, with the grant requirements. Um, and then this was also the area where, um, you know, the advisory body can make recommendations for improvements to the complaints process. So ways um, for the commission to kind of uh, take a look at its own processes and make improvements here. Um, and then, uh, and then yes, in subsection F, it's that the advisory body's recommendation is a recommendation unless everybody agrees. So this is another area where if at this stage, the complainant and the grantee agree with the recommendation, they feel like there's been enough review of the matter and um, you know sufficient oversight and agree with the, the outcome of the informal conference that it could be resolved at this point. Um, it wouldn't require full commission review if everybody agrees. But if not, then the final step would be to refer it to the commission to consider the recommendation from the advisory body. So, um, and then again, this builds in the timeline that um, the commission will review it at its next scheduled meeting. That's at least 10 days away for, for notice purposes. Um, and so that it'll keep it, um, again, uh, leading to a point of finality uh, without letting it kind of be trailed uh, potentially. Um, and then these last three subsections, the main updates were, as I mentioned before, that in the current version of the rule, they're really, it's kind of silent about what happens with corrective action. Um, so the recommendation is that any determination that corrective action is appropriate would be a final decision by the commission. Um, and again, moving any consideration of termination of funding out of this rule and into 3.691, which already has um, kind of the whole process for, for when you reach that point. So, um, so as far as, you know, um, discussion at this point, the, the main points are that the current proposal for the rule is the same, like the actual changes to the rule are the same as what was in the original uh, memo that went out to the Legal Aid Association of California. Um, but there was that point about anonymous complaints that, um, you know, the working group acknowledged that the, the concerns that are raised by the legal aid community, but felt that there might uh, be scenarios where an anonymous complaint would be appropriate and wants to kind of discuss that in more depth um, with the committee uh, to provide guidance to staff, because um, even though it's not part of the rule, staff uh, staff's intention is to create a, an online reporting page for lodging these complaints to facilitate access to the process. So um, with that, I am happy to answer other questions or, you know. Um... I have some follow-up as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, first, it's been incredibly rewarding to work with Pam and Erica on this. Um, just a very thoughtful discussion. So thank you to both of them. And uh, lax feedback, very well summarized, was also really very helpful and made us aware of issues that we would not otherwise have known about, um, especially the harassment piece. Man, people can be awful. Um, uh, it was really exciting. I went so far as to make my own flowchart diagram of this process, which I am glad to share because I'm very, very proud of it. Um, but <laughs> noting that it's not official or controlling or anything, um, if anybody has any uh, questions or confusion. 
I would highlight uh, just a couple of points. I think uh, when I went through it, the shortest time, assuming that we had 30 day minimums to get through all the deadlines, to get through a complaint is about 30 days, assuming there's no resolution reached, right? And there's a trust fund meeting coming up really soon. Um, that's three months. Uh, sorry, I said 30 days, but I meant three months. Three months, the longest time frame was about one year. Uh, I just wanna highlight that. It is longer than I would want, but when you go through the time frames, we were trying to really allow the collaborative resolution process to work. And we just didn't wanna squeeze it too much. So it was, a, it was trade offs. Um, and then uh, I, I'm still a little disappointed that we couldn't find a way to keep it from having to go before the full commission for resolution. I don't think that's ideal, but it is the least worst option. Um, as far as I could tell, we could, if I understand properly, designate a standing committee that would then have the authority to dismiss complaints, um, but that was frowned upon. I think we didn't want another uh, standing committee. So it's still an option out there, but I did want to make everyone aware as written, the changes would result in a written report being made to the full commission and then coming before the commission for either dismissal or further action. Bill, can I ask you a quick question? Um, what why, what, what concerns you about it going to the full commission? Is it like a resources problem or are you concerned about? It's, it's both. <laughs> or I don't even know what the other one is. Oh, okay. <laughs> tell me, tell well, me. I will say the, the um, I think it opens a can of worms where at the, the last time we had a complaint we had to deal with at the commission, there were a lot of very legitimate questions. So a lot of education had to take place and there was a lot of discussion. And so that, I felt took up unnecessary amount of time. Um, so it, I think it invites discussion. Uh, what is it they, the example that they give, you know, deciding the color of a shed um, is the example that they give where it's everyone has an opinion. And so I think I would have liked to have avoided that if at all possible, but I, I erred on the side of let's get a final resolution and that's gonna require coming before the full commission. And hopefully there aren't too many questions and there's no you know, continuing of that discussion. It gets resolved quickly. Does that answer your question, Erica? Yeah, I guess, I, and you're concerned that, as in like you want it to be speedier for the, the organization, for the complainant, for both? I think in general, the quicker we resolve it, the better. Um, but if, if there's a first public hearing means um, the opportunity for public embarrassment and things I think can go off the rails, uh, but I don't know that that's always the case. And I think we will see as the, it gets used, as the process gets used, whether that is a change that needs to take place. Mm, okay, I hear you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not saying it's bad. So as written, it comes to the full commission. Um, and then I think the other, other two points I wanted to hit was, I really feel like the online form is so important. I think it would be great. And I think the anonymity discussion needs to, uh, continue. Uh, my concern with confidential complaints is that we might not, because of public records requirements, be able to provide confidentiality if someone makes a complaint um, and doesn't want to be identified. I think they might only have a choice of being anonymous or <laughs> being on record. Even if the staff withholds that, I think the, uh, the, the agency that being complained against could then say, no, we wanna know who, and we're filing a public records request. Um, so it's a complicated issue. And speaking personally, I think the anonymous part is really important for people who are not in a position of power 
And if they observe behavior which may not directly impact them, but uh, is not appropriate. And I have a specific example there if we wanna discuss it further, but I'll hold it for now. And I think the final piece was the, I wanted to suggest we consider adding to either 3.692A or B, something to provide a little bit of transparency on the immediate dismissal piece. Um, and my framing was roughly complaints that are unrelated to the trust fund requirements or that are malicious or lack a clear, a clear allegation or don't have merit can be dismissed by staff. And that then the person can be notified and have an opportunity to amend their complaint and appeal. But I don't, I, I recognize the concern from the legal aid community where they still have to field as written, they still have to field the complaint because staff has to forward that complaint to them. Even if it lacks merit or um, isn't something we would normally handle, at least as written. And I think we would wanna consider adding some language to allow staff to make a dis quick dismissal if it's that kind of harassment. Um, I'm not sure what that language would be or where it should be, but I really wanted to get that suggestion out there. That was all I had. Uh, thank you. Catherine? Um, my, I guess just on the timeline question, I, I do feel like if, if Will's calculation is accurate, that it takes up, can take up to a year, that's a very long period of time. And I think there's reasons to have things, at least an effort to resolve things more quickly. I, I wondered, at least as I read it, it looked like this advisory committee had up with is 120 days from the date that they get the complaint or the date the complaints filed. That just seemed 120 days seems like a very long time, regardless. That's four months roughly. Like, does an advisory committee need four months to be able to do that? And then my other thought about saving time and you know, I, I, I'm not suggesting a standing committee, but can could the executive committee just take this on? I mean, that's usually like my board had a grievance committee that could be called on short notice. Um, there was always the an executive committee member in that. So what if we just use the trust fund executive committee as the final decision maker who was taking these complaints rather than it having to go to the full commission? I just think that's another way to save a period of time. I think we had suggested that at some point. I can't recall now why um, it was taken off the table, but I think that executive committee, at least from my, my recollection, was on the table. Yeah. I think Erica Carroll and then Erica Connolly. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the uh, 120 days aspect. Um, so part of it is that within those 120 days, both the complainant and the grant recipient are going to have at least 30 to respond to the staff report. So that takes up a month. And then, um, you know, I think that uh, there was discussion and Will or Pam can jump in if you remember this better than I do, but about, you know, that complainants may not um, be able able to, um, particularly if they're a client, you know, accommodate short timelines in terms of trying to show up to informal conferences or um, just wanting to be kind of like cognizant of um, any challenges or, or also even for the advisory committee members that, um, you know, might have other obligations and can't always do it on short notice. So I think the intent would be, of course, to try to do it sooner, but that Again, that would be like the outer limit, not the, but I also understand that it could be seen as like, well, we have 120 days, so <laughs> we'll take up but that whole time if we want to, but. I, I, I wondered then, like, so I appreciate, you know, sometimes it's hard to reach a complainant, sometimes it's hard to schedule something, but it could be a shorter timeline with the option of the complainant having a continuance if the time yeah. didn't, like, if it was necessary for them to be able to even put their information, you know, they have to do something within 30 days. I mean, that can, you know, if you're, if you're a person that has difficulty getting your thoughts on paper, you might want a continuance for that. And that could push out the timelines. Or if you can't attend a meeting at a time it's noted, like, I think there's ways to allow that flexibility without making it look like it's going to take four months for 
an advisory committee to, to make a decision. So I, I guess I'd, I'd be interested in alternate ways we could achieve what's a really good intention. Effie, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so uh, I I wanted to first say, like, I, I support what Catherine's saying on that front. Um, you know, I, I mean, there's a sort of fundamental question that sort of talk, speaks to, like, Will's point about the anonymity. Or is this complaint procedure a whistleblowing thing or is this a um because I, I think the examples that Will is like talking about they strike me as like whistleblowing right I, I understand the power dynamics for like actual like um I recognize that too but like it makes me think like do we have a whistleblowing <laughs> like way to do this because you know if you were doing <laughs> You know, as far as like PRA requests and like that kind of stuff, like, you, you know, if you have, there's, there are ways in which you could kind of structure a whistleblowing kind of way and keep some of that more confidential. And this may not be that way to do it, which is why anonymity may not be, you know, I take Will's point that, and I don't, I, I don't recall off the top of my head, all the PRA exceptions. And I know that there's like some investigatory, like, you know, exceptions to it. And I, I defer to Brady on that. I know that we're subject to PRA and we definitely don't disclose all of our investigatory stuff. Um, you know, but having said that, some complaints are subject to, to disclosure. Um, but I, I just, I just throw that out there and I'm not trying to like upend this at all, but I'm just saying like that, that there may be like a, a way to have an, an, an anonymous avenue that's not this structure, you know, but I don't know whether that's, you know, that might be the way to kind of deal with this in the longer term, just to throwing out a suggestion. And, um, and on the timelines, I'll just say like, yes, they take, they seem long, but I, I also know like how long like litigation goes and even like private arbitration takes like a really long time. So I actually think in some ways, if we get this all, I mean, a year is a long time, but like, it's also like, if you're doing an investigation and trying to do informal resolution, like it doesn't, it's not totally surprising to me, but yeah. Oh, one other thing is I do actually think all of the complaints should, I, I think it's good for them to all go to the particular organizations just so for due process, so they have a heads up, even if there is some more expedited, like clearing out. I don't think we should not tell them about it because it's good for them to be aware that there are these, that a complaint was made is all well to your point. Like, I'm not saying they necessarily have to like deal with it, but like, right. it's good for the, I, I would want to know if someone had filed a complaint against me. That's a, that's a really excellent point. I just don't want them to feel like they had to respond and then it's taking up their limited staff time, but you know, point well made. Um, Boy, I'm, that was that was so much good stuff. The, I, I since I have the floor, I'm going to go ahead and respond to the the whistleblower part because that was one of the first things that came to mind is how do we handle whistleblower uh, complaints in an appropriate way. My understanding from Erica is that that is something on a future agenda that's going to be worked on, and that this process would not handle those complaints. Is that correct, Erica? <laughs> Yeah, um, we wanted to look okay. into that further um, because there isn't yep. a clear policy at the moment and maybe Brady can speak to that more. But um, so we um, did not want to address it through this process at the moment and create, so like make it a separate separate thing. So. Yeah, I, I thought it was something really important. So agreed. Um, I'll jump in on, on two things. I, I'm just sort of, um, this conversation's going great without me. <laughs> um, uh, the one thought I had, and I, I looked at the, the sort of, this is uh, with respect to the suggestion of a, um, a staff dismissal. And I'm not sure if I fully see the need for it. And I do see some concerns that from the 
the potential complainant community to, to the extent there is one that you know that that puts too much power in the hands of staff. And and the reason is that if a if a baseless complaint comes in, it can kind of go through the process very quickly, the, the existing process. And I'm not sure how that's much different than saying, oh, staff can dismiss a complaint if it finds this, but then the complainant can appeal anyway. So wouldn't that appeal involve the same process? So it, it, it seems like you're sort of making a statement that, that doesn't necessarily um, have a huge impact on, on what actually happens, which is that, you know, in, in the case of a threadbare and improper complaint, it's, it's real quick. You have the quick call with the, uh, you know, with the, with the grantee, with the, the um, um, uh, complainant, try to resolve it. If they don't, the, the, the recommendation is pretty clear and pretty simple, and there's probably not much, much to discuss. Um, um, thank you very much, Erica. Um, I, I just was on the phone with our CPRA person, and um, there's not a, there's not a blanket exception. Um, licensing investigations, like for instance, of um, um, licensees, there's a specific exemption, but there is a deliberative process uh, exemption under the CPRA. Um, and it's basically a balancing test applies. And um, I, I'm glad I had that call because, um, you know, she said definitely we'd, we'd make the argument, you know, the public policy behind, you know, uh, promoting disclosure um, by complaining witnesses, blah, 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 blah. Um, but she did say that it would be helpful um, since we're looking at this rule to, um, to add some language saying, you know, these sh to the extent permissible by law, these shall be kept confidential. Um, so I will work with Suzanne to, to add some, to get some magic language that would help um, make those arguments that if we got a CPRA request, we shouldn't have to disclose. But the, the status quo is that we would we would say, no, this, we don't have to produce this. And you know, 99% of the time, that's the end of it. Um, on the what, on the, on the whistleblower, I mean, I think that the adding, having a confidentiality provision probably goes a long way. Um, I, I had mentioned to Erica that the state bar is sort of working and I'm, I haven't been involved on a, on a broader um, whistleblower policy that I, I'm not sure whether it would touch this or not, um, but I can learn more about that. Um, but but I'm, I don't think of this as a whistleblower situation necessarily. I mean, to the extent that these complainants are gonna be employees of grantees, they already have protections under the labor code from retaliation by their employer. So I, I don't, I didn't initially see a need to really get involved with that, um, especially if we're gonna, you know, buttress our confidentiality arguments and then see what's going on larger. Um, and, and I will try and find out what, what that is and sort of report back. So those are, those are my thoughts so far. Sweet. I'm gonna... I had some uh, response. I think that would be really awesome if we can make the confidentiality piece clear. Um, I think on the clarifying the staff dismissal piece, I was thinking of being a victim of our own success if we put an online form up where we might uh, get more complaints than we want to have to deal with and as I understand right now, a complaint will come in, uh, staff has 10 days to share that with the grantee, and then they still have to issue a recommendation. So they have to go through the process, they have to talk to everybody, even if it's totally lacks merit, like I didn't get service, I didn't like the way this person talked to me, and it was ridiculous, and you know, I, <laughs> and all of these things where I feel like that's more of a possibility if we have an online form and that providing staff the opportunity to go ahead and say, we're gonna dismiss this. Now, if somebody is continuing to have what I would call a bad day and wants to press the issue, well then, okay, I guess we are gonna to have to go through the whole process. But I think adding a clear off-ramp where it involves the fewest people possible addresses that concern of just w allowing this to become a process where people get to waste time um, unnecessarily. And I, I guess I have faith in staff to usually get it right and being like, this lacks merit, or this is something that's so far outside of our governing authorities that we're not going to consider that. 
Now, if we only get five complaints through an online form, obviously this won't be an issue, but if we get 500, the ability to dispatch them quickly becomes more important. And so I thought in, in that framing, it would be important to address now. And that was my thinking, Brady. I, I hope that clarifies um, there. I don't know if you want to respond or if we want to move on to other questions, but. Well, it's, I mean, it's, um, and, and maybe the, the answer is if we do something, it's sort of the devil's in the details, because, you know, with even with your example, um, oh, they didn't, it's still, I, I feel like that the, the complaint process at least offers a chance to check in because, hey, you know, they're satisfied, dissatisfied because you wouldn't take the case, you know, oh, well, you know, like, like you know, ABA standards say this, do you, do you have clear intake standards? Are they communicated, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's just sort of a, you know, not necessarily burdensome, but a quick conversation of, oh, this came up, get their response, you know, because even if, even if it's, it's not something that's gonna to lead to corrective action, it could, um, you know, under the standards point to a way that these things can be avoided. I think that that came up with one a, a couple of months ago. Um, I think it's a separate question, maybe whether whether it's for you know some sort of frivolous or litigious, uh, um, vexatious litigant type standard where you know somebody keeps bombarding us with 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 complaints, then then it becomes um, you know if the staff makes a finding of X, you know then it can be a denial and this denial can only be appealed you know in X manner rather than sending it through the whole whole process. But I don't know I don't know how. Um, I don't know if we're going to go from five to five hundred, but but it is definitely worth thinking about what what, what we do if, if we did. Yeah, I think good faith complaints will continue to be processed under this. Uh, I'm thinking of the bad faith and considering what Lack said about how many bad faith complaints they were getting, I, I feel like it would be important to find some way to address that. Okay, I'm done. Eric, I think you're next, and then Catherine. Yeah, so I guess there's a couple of things I want to respond on that. Like, first, having like clerked, like there's obviously people who um, who like take advantage of the litigation process, and and even in the courts, you have to have a finding of a vexatious litigate litigant, and there might be that might be a standard we should consider to Brady's point, like employing, right, like. You know, and we don't necessarily do it with this rulemaking, but that that is definitely something that we can like look to the courts on as far as what are a particular, you know, um, a, a certain number, a certain frivolousness, whatever, so that they can be streamlined. But I will say this, I do think there is value in giving people an opportunity to be heard. And, and I do think that like, you know, what, what, when it, when is it meritless because the person just like doesn't understand the rules and when is it meritless, meritless because they're being harassing, like that's, that's a really weird line. And so I think like, you know, I, this is why I'm, I'm a little hesitant to support a staff streamlined without some other kind of standard about like vexatiousness or harassment that we can find in order to like, you know, get, get that out. And, you know, cause I think there's probably lots of complaints that come in that are technically meritless, but like, it's good to like have, you know, they, what, like to Brady's point one, we get a chance to check in, but also, you know, it's people want to be heard about their issues. And so that, that's my, why I'm at least at this point, more resistant to doing something totally streamlined, but I, I'm I'm very open to like some kind of vexatious litigant standard to then address that issue that you're you're talking about. Well, because you're right, like we don't want, you know, <laughs> if it does become an issue, you know, we don't want staff having to be doing this like or or agencies having to do this like constantly. So that that's my two cents on this. Catherine, I think you're next. 
I'll, I'll just be very brief because my comment um, is similar to Erica's. And I, I think a narrow standard makes sense. And I, I'll just add to the narrow standard. I mean, sometimes you're going to get complaints that might not have anything to do with a legal services program. I'm assuming you already appropriately respond and say, you shouldn't be here, you should go over there kind of thing. So I mean, it's sort of a, there, you don't have jurisdiction really, so to speak, about the complaint because it's not concerning a program and you should be able to quickly dispense with those. So I, I don't know what the right narrow standard is, but I think we could come up with something that, that allowed something that at least on the face of it was some, you know, that that raised a complaint against a program and maybe the person didn't put it in the right words, but it's worth a call to that person to find out what, what are they complaining about and not just dismissing it because they couldn't articulate what they what their actual issue was. So to me, it's a careful line and I'm, I'm probably aligned with where Erica is on it. Selena, do you wanna go? I think mine is also in line with what others are saying. Um, if, it, if an online portal is created, I think it would help to, to provide information through the portal to say, you know, if your issue is X, this is the right place to complain. If your issue is everything else, here are the places to go, not like go away, but here's the appropriate places to make a complaint if it's an attorney misconduct, if it's something else. Because um, I, I do hear if somebody it has an issue with an organization and they start Googling to figure out where to go, if they get to, to the trust fund portal, they, that should be the no wrong door to actually have their issues addressed. Um, and so, you know, if, if an online portal is created, you know, LSC has some good information there and a lot of information about confidentiality, but also I remember, um, it's been more than a week since I looked at the page, but, but I think they also include like, make sure you're using the client grievance procedure of the organization too. And so it's really making sure that they have all the resources, um, understanding if this is, you know, a 90 day process, they may need their claims resolved more quickly if it's a denial of service. Thank you. Well. That was so heartening to hear because as, as someone who's had to or felt the desire to complain uh, and gotten that rejection from like, well, this is not our problem. Um, so thank you, Erica and Catherine on that. I agree very strongly. Um, and I, I think I was only thinking in terms of, of really bad faith complaints um, on, and, and even with the anonymous or confidential complaints, I'll, I'll briefly give my experience. I was in a, um, a clinic before I was even on the commission where I was listening. We were working through the, the computers together through some forums and this volunteer was talking to the person next to me and, and he was explaining his problems and she was listening. And it was very concerning because she misunderstood what he was saying and then gave him advice on what to do. And that advice sounded wrong. Now, maybe I was wrong, but she wasn't an attorney. She was just a volunteer. And it was all kinds of like, for me and my limited paralegal experience, I was like, that was UPL all over the place. And I was not going to complain to that organization. I was about to be like, can you give me this person's name? <laughs> and There's kidding. no way, right? Because I want help. From Are they them. charging money? That's right. not okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was all free, it, but I want help from the organization. And so I'm not going to be the guy who's like, hey, it looks like you guys are breaking the rules because um, I still want to be able to go back and don't want to leave the bad taste of like, oh, there's the guy who reported us. So I think it's great that we are having that conversation and that there is a lot of openness to making sure that we allow no wrong door was a, a great turn of phrase where we, we get them pointed in the right direction. Um, and to all of, to respond to all of that, when I, my current understanding is we don't have the ability as the rule is written to just dismiss because it's not our quote unquote jurisdiction. It still has to go through the, the process of sending the, the complaint within 10 days and within 90 days, um, sh issuing a recommendation. And that feels like that's not necessarily the best use of staff time. And when they might be able to review it and say, just, just respond to the complaint and say, 
this doesn't meet our criteria, we're going to dismiss it. If you want to appeal, you can. And um, putting the onus back on them, I think is a nice little bit of resistance. Oh, that is a beautiful cat. Um, <laughs> a little bit of resistance that could help prevent that sort of abusive behavior. And I don't know if we can share the language and see if that, if that would meet this criteria of allowing being narrowly crafted, or if we just wanna nix the idea and just see how it goes with an online form and then consider it in the future. But really you guys restored my faith in humanity for today because uh, that was really nice. Thank you. Amin, did you wanna go? Yeah, you know, I, I like the idea and I think that it's, it's important you know, the, the complaints, giving people an, an opportunity and, a, and an avenue by which they can see how they make the complaint, what, where they get, what, what I'm, what I'm a little bit concerned about. And I, and I just quickly looked up, you know, the, looks, the bar has a complaints page for complaints about licensees and unauthorized legal providers. Do we want to sort of build this into that? I, I, I guess, you know, the concern might be that it might, you know, there may be more people going to this page and then saying, oh, well, you know, this, this may lead to more complaints. It may not, but um, do we wanna not have sort of like multiple avenues by which people have to go, you know, into different places, but kind of keep it all central for the bar? Um, throwing it out there as, as, a, as a question because you know, how does this play? Like, let's say there is a complaint that's about sort of the service that's being provided by a particular individual attorney of an organization. Um, is that a complaint against the organization or is that a complaint against the attorney? Kind of curious how that plays out internally at the bar. I think generally if there's a complaint against the attorney, we redirect them um, and um, Duane, Elizabeth, Erica, do you know if we've actually forwarded complaints or do we usually re redirect them? You mean like a, a, a complaint against a specific attorney? Uh, yeah. We, we would forward the a complaint against any attorney to uh, okay. OCTC. Yeah. And, I, and think, um, I think that, I mean, if, if we wanted to look into it, we could, but, but I, I, I would imagine that, um, that Oh, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel rightly might not want mixing of this with their, their complaints program, which is one of the biggest focuses of, of this organization um, statutorily. Um, can, can I just add on to that, uh, Brady? Um, uh, I think, I mean, the page you're looking at, um, there's like a side menu where there's like complaints also for lawyer referral services, but the, there's not a link on the actual page, but there's like in the menu where you can go there. Um, I would possibly suggest that complaint, these types of complaints would be more in line with those lawyer referral service complaints and maybe those could be grouped together. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, make, that makes sense to me. I, I guess the, just thinking about it in terms of how this how this plays out for somebody who wants to make a complaint, like what, where are they going to go? What do they do? The likelihood is that they're going to go to the state bar complaint page, and maybe that's a place where this kind of yeah lives in some way. Maybe not in the same process, but at least there's an explanation mm -hmm. or an op opportunity for them to find it. Yeah, actually, now, now now that I look, I think that maybe in that gray section where it talks about the other kinds of complaints. Yeah, exactly. Sense. I would say we haven't actually had a chance to like interface with our communications department um, to figure out logistically all, all of these, but that, that would be once, if this gets passed in some form, um, we can start to do that. And then also we can bring it back and get thoughts from you all. Okay, so I think Will and then Selena. And then I just wanna do a quick time check because we're at the halfway mark and um, Dan's group probably needs about 45 minutes um, to talk about law, law school issues. Um, I guess I wanted to clarify whether my understanding of the rule was cl correct, where every complaint that comes in can't be dismissed. It would still have to be forwarded to the organization, regardless of its whether it had any merit or not. 
is that currently, I don't, I don't think that's how it's currently handled, but under this rule is that how it would need to be handled. Well, that's how it's currently handled also, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, 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 we get such, we get a handful of these every year. Um, so yeah, we, we contact the organization and let them know. That's how it's currently handled and that's how, even if it's a, proposing a change to that. Okay, even if it's a matter totally unrelated to our governing authorities, it still gets forwarded on. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Then hopefully that won't be. And I don't know, we've had an instance where it's totally, and that's why I paused a little bit there. I mean, we really get less than five of these a year. And I can't recall in my seven years here where there's something totally unrelated, so. Right, I guess with an online form, which is, I think would be such an excellent addition that I wanna anticipate a flood because I my understanding is the Office of Trial Counsel did get a flood when the attorney form came online. And if we can help staff and legal aid organizations process those efficiently, then I am all for that because they are doing more important work than, <laughs> than dealing with totally unmeritorious complaints. Um, but if there's not a consensus around that, I'll le let that go and wanted to respond to Catherine on the 120 days um, cause that was way back, but I just wanted to note that that was also included having a conference, the informal conference. So it's the 30 days for the grantee and complainant to respond additionally to the staff report. And then after that 30 days, uh, what is that 90 days to have a conference and for, uh, if they have a conference, they get a, an additional 60 days. So. I'm not too, I wouldn't be, feel bad shortening that up, but uh, because they have to have that conference within there and they get the 30 days, I, I, we were trying to allow a lot of time. I hope that answers it, but maybe not. No, no I mean, it, it answers it. I personally think it's too long and I don't think anyone's well served by these taking a long time. It, it's, it's better to have right. a quicker resolution for the program and for the person that's making a complaint, I think. So, and I, that's why I was trying to sort of identify ways that the time could be potentially shortened, but allow a continuance if the complaint is agreeable to extending the timelines maybe. Or that anyone could request one for good cause. That, that sounds like it would be a great way of addressing it and, and maybe shortening up some of these, these times. Yeah. I, I'm fine with adding up. I need anyone can request it for good cause. That that's fine. Yeah, with that, I would I would be glad to drop it to sixty days. Um, personally, I speak for myself. Uh, thank you, Selena. Do you want to go and then Pamela? Yeah, and I'm I can be very quick. So when I think Amin mentioned the like um, online portal for attorney misconduct, and I just looked at it, and there's a really amazing infographic on after you file an attorney misconduct complaint. And so if, if there is an online portal for agency complaints, I think something like this is really fantastic because it's an infographic explaining what to expect and timelines, um, which I think would be helpful not only for people making complaints, but also for organizations um, who have, you know, since there's so few of them that you get an organization may be the very first time they have a complaint and the infographic is just really fantastic. So I wish I could share, but since I can't chat, if you want to just look on the State Bar's website, it's after you file, an attorney misconduct complaint. And it's in multiple languages too. Thanks, Selena. Pamela, did you wanna go? My com comments rather in terms of the timeline was that they will be completed within the 90 days. So my thing was the, the maximum um, time from start to finish with the 90 days, give them you know time to they can acknowledge you we're working on this process, but at least by 90 days, it is totally resolved in writing um, to both parties. So that would end that situation. So. Should we like look at the, the rule and like start like wordsmithing given the time to like <clears throat> address maybe the timing issues and stuff? Cause I, it seems like we're kind of in agreement with this process and it may just be a matter of tweaking some of the things and then we could like the online form is not part of the rules, so maybe we could like right. get started on it so we could actually get the rule. 
Eric, did you want to share your screen or? Sure. Sorry, just a suggestion. If we want more discussion, we can, but I, I was thinking we might want to do No, it. all the discussion that's left is uh, whether we're tweaking the rules and how, is, is my feeling. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I started to try to incorporate some of the feedback I was hearing, but obviously feel free to continue to wordsmith it. Yeah. Um, thanks for adding the two calendar days. I think that's probably just an easy way to extend the deadline by two days or something without adding a whole other thing. Um, okay, so we wanted to switch the 120. Mm -hmm. 90. Um, with, with a... With a 692E. D. Okay, so 60 days of submission. I think you said you wanted it to be for good cause. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense. I think there should be a reason for continuing it, so that seems fine. Do, you, do we want to say up to 60 days? Because then that gets to the, the 120 from before. I don't know. I mean, another way to do it, I'm not sure where it comes up in addition to here, but could be just a separate letter paragraph saying that, um, you know, um, complainants or grantees may seek ex ex extensions of deadlines under this rule, which shall be grant, you know, which for good cause. So I think that makes sense because I'm, are we like, this is the total number, but what if a grantee, I don't know, their ED got COVID and they couldn't yeah. respond within the 30 days. So I like Brady's suggestion of just doing a, yeah. any of these can be extended. Um, so changing it to 60 is fine there, and then just taking the continuance of any timeline down to the end. End. And yeah, I like that idea too. Yeah. And then the other, I think, easily modified time frame is after the informal conference. There's 60 days for a recommendation to be issued, I believe. I don't know if we want to shorten that at all. Deadlines. Sorry, I missed that one. Oh, do you want to finish your thought? Eric? Yeah. Yeah, first. I would, sorry, I think Brady was saying any of the above deadlines instead of timelines. Oh, okay, sorry. No, it's okay. Do we also want to let staff, like us, have an extension for good cause? Or is it only only the complaining grant recipient? I'm not saying we do need to give us a time a deadline or a, an ability to do a continuance, but like just something as a heads up. Right now we don't have that. Um, I don't know optically, and plus it's usually not okay. staff. Like we can always rotate staff if one of our staff that was staffed on it, you know, was unavailable. Great, no problem. I just wanted to make sure we talked about it. Sorry, did, did we do we want to put a, li a limit on the length of the extension? Well, I mean, I feel like you have to show good cause for what you're asking for. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think. yeah. I I mean, who? What's a, a little unclear to me is who would be granting the extension? It would have to be bar. State bar. Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be basically. I, I think it's probably implied whomever, whomever you know, if, you, if it's for the advisory body. Oh, okay. okay. You know what I mean? I I, I don't. Thank you. And then okay. Brady's always available. <laughs> Brady, <laughs> which is right, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry. I put myself on number in there. <laughs> you know, I, think that, I, I guess speaking of advisory body, I think there was Catherine's comment of should the advisory body be the executive committee, and and I can't honestly recall why we struck that. Uh, not the advisory body, the the I final she meant the commission for the the end. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, that was what I was yes. suggesting. Yes. yes. Um. It, well. Before we before we go back to that, if we're saying that they can request, I mean, I, I just want to be, make sure that we're sort of clear. If we're saying that they can request an extension, 
for a good cause? Or should we should we instead be saying may obtain an extension? Yeah. For good yeah. Cause? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. And then and then. That's good. We don't have to worry about kind of having to decide who enumerate who. And then maybe on the portal, you could put more details on like who to request in the infographic that like Selena suggested. You could say like, at this stage, ask so-and-so. At this stage, ask so-and-so. Right. Okay. Asking the detailed questions. Really. And so this I would- I wouldn't worry. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't worry if they if it's only available on- on Brady, you want to mute yourself? I don't know We're all learning the advice that Brady makes. <laughs> And this would uh, shorten the deadline, the 60 days, instead of 120, it would become 60. And then instead of 60 for the informal conference, it's is it 30, is that what you wrote? Yeah, I mean, that was just, you know, as a placeholder, if you wanna shorten the timeline, but I hadn't heard a specific, you know, request or recommendation for what would be the appropriate. I time. think, I think that sounds good to me. I'm good with that as well. Yeah, same. Yeah, same. Uh, what's the other? Did we want to add confidentiality language in here at all for the PRA stuff? I I would add that for the PRA stuff. I think that's. Helpful. Yeah, I fully really support that. <laughs> And I don't I honestly like I'm okay with just saying staff's going to draft confidentiality language because that you know will protect it from disclosure in a PRA like whatever that's going to look like I, I don't feel like we can wordsmith that as a group today so I, I would be fine voting for this even if that language wasn't there. Yeah, we can put yeah that I think that's a good suggestion because um, Brady can work with Suzanne and then yeah. um, Eric and I can look at it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure there's a way to do yeah. it and I'm not going to have that much to add to it anyway, but conceptually, I think that's important. Yeah. Okay. And then is the last question whether this should go to the full commission or is there an ability for it to go to the executive committee then? As the final body. Yeah. Final review. Yeah. I, I think. I, there is. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. I think the idea was when you get to that level, no matter what you're doing, it's going to be at a publicly noticed hearing. And so it just allows for more flexibility of when you can schedule that hearing because you have fewer people, mm -hmm. right, to work around a schedule of. And I think one of the delays is if you're trying to attach it to a regular commission meeting, you do, if you do it nine days before the commission meeting and it's not noticed, it's going to be another quarter, right? So it's just going to yeah. extend that timeline um, in ways that, and I and I'm assuming the executive committee would report to the commission about you know the the outcome, which I I think is fine. I just anyway, that's my suggestion, but I I will live with whatever the wisdom of the group is. <laughs> I think that makes I like that. Think it does make us more flexible and the executive committee they they know that they're meeting at least four times and like this year they've had to add already four meetings so it, <laughs> there's already inherent within that um i i agree with that suggestion as long as it also reports out to the commission what happened there i i think that would help expedite the complaints i know that just giving everybody a fair hearing i think was our our hope. So I'm not sure how much has to change, though, to accommodate. Well, that. we might need to explicitly say that the executive committee is empowered to do this. I don't know that I defer to Brady, but we may need a line in here that the executive committee has responsibility for this and then swap out commission for executive committee. I mean, I think I think um, I think the rule saying it goes to the executive committee is is the is the delegation right 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 yeah yeah as long as there's no statute that would supersede that right which I don't yeah these, these are all these are all our regulations made pursuant to 6225 and then I think the only question I had left was whether we did want to try and wordsmith something to allow staff to dispatch bad faith complaints more quickly, or if we just want to table that for now. 
I don't think I managed to convince anybody, but I want to make sure. I, I don't know whether we can do this at this meeting, but my suggestion on that is you create a vexatious litigant standard. And that is a provision where you say, you know, and then that would still have to go, I think, to the executive committee, but essentially you'd say something like, you know, uh, if there are multiple um, <clears throat> baseless or frivolous complaints, you know, and uh, then you have to give notice to the complainant that you're going to do this, and then it goes up, and then that's a whole other, it'll be litigious about whether there's a vexatious litig litigation uh, litigant issue. And then once you find that, then you can just clear them out. That's what they do at the court. And right. that, and that I think provides, would provide the due process. Could we bring up, I mean, how does this work, Erica? Is the next stop the commission? Mm -hmm. I mean, could we, could we come with that sort of as an option for an addition? Just, just, just the. I'm, I'm fine with that, Brady. I mean, I feel like there's been enough discussion here where people think having some out is a, a good thing. So, and I don't think it's something, as Erica said, we're going to be able to draft sitting here today. And, mm -hmm. but it would be yeah. nice to be able to think about, you know, like have some work done on it and then the commission can decide what to do. And Selena, do you think that would address the concerns of harassment and that? the legal aid community expressed? Would that be sufficient? I feel like we would we need to almost try it out to see how many there are. Because I, I think that it's very easy to do a complaint on Yelp or with the Better Business Bureau. I think that filing a complaint with the state bar feels more serious. And so that might even of itself be a filter for people who wouldn't be filing false complaints. Oh, I mean, would it be correct? To say, I think if since since we're discussing whether to just leave it or um, or have some maybe a relatively high threshold vexatious litigant standard, it, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt from the program's perspective. I don't think it would hurt, and I also just don't know how many complaints we will get. I feel like we're just guessing. It may still be five every year, or it yeah. may be you know a hundred, but there's still you know maybe five that have some sort of merit or worthy of investigation well i imagine this will increase it from five but um yeah <laughs> who knows how much but but yeah i mean if, if it does in fact become a hundred which hopefully not um we might need to revisit all of this in the process anyways because our, our where our staffing right now isn't equipped to handle 100 complaints yeah so so, oh, but do, do you need the authority? So like, I think one of the, what will happen with an online complaint is people won't figure out that this is a IOLTA funded program. And so they're gonna file against any legal aid program. And so do you already, do you need the authority to dismiss it from, a dismiss a complaint that's not against a qualified organization or do you just inherently have that? I would say, I would say we are inherently have it just because if we that's scroll correct. up, if, Good answer, Brady. I mean, if, <laughs> no, if we scroll up, it, this is about complaints against grantees. So if you okay. send me something that's just not that, right? Um, well, this is where the website recipient. needs to So if you're not a grant recipient, you haven't, you, haven't, you haven't filed a formal written complaint against a grant recipient. Okay, that's perfect. Perfect answer. So I think we just need to be clear on the portal um, and maybe link it to the list of IELTS organizations and be very, very super yeah. clear up front on that. Least... And we'll still get we'll still get organizations that aren't, but at least, yeah. My my type A is kicking in. Can you take that 12 off after fund requirements right under? There you go. It's uh, <laughs> I copied and pasted. It's a footnote in the <laughs> it's, it's a footnote in the rule, <laughs> but it didn't copy over the footnote itself. So. so are we ready for a motion to recommend the approval understanding? that the staff will be drafting a confidentiality provision and a vexatious litigant provision that will be considered by the full commission as part of the recommendation. And if so, I will make that motion. Sorry, can I ask one question before? Sure. Um, the recommendation for it to go to the executive committee, I don't know if this impacts anybody's opinion or perspective, but one of the possible 
outcomes or recommendations would be to consider the complaint under 3.691, which is termination of funding. So then the executive committee would be potentially considering termination of funding to a grantee. And I don't know if you want to, if you want that, or if you want to build something in that, if that's the case, then it needs to go to the full commission. Or... I think that should go to the full commission if it, if it actually triggers 3.691. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. So, I, but I would do it as an exception, like what you, the second part of what you said, Erica, that if it's, if if the recommendation is going to be termination of, of funding, then the full commission has to consider it. Okay. Good catch. Yeah, Duan. Procedurally, are we? Is this still on the agenda for the commission on June seventeenth? Um, it, it can be. The the only, the, and but it doesn't need to be because. Um, and I, I guess I'll take a moment to talk about the work plan. The first set of um, recommendations that are going to go to the Board of Trustees um, is going to be our, some of our foundational issues, which is the definition of civil legal services, industry, and primary purpose. And that's not slated to go until the end of the year. So it's not urgent. I mean, if we if we got it in time, like if Brady can help draft those two things and Erica can gear up for June, then we can go in June. It's still fresh in your in your heads um, to then you know provide more, but it doesn't have to be because that that's the timeline. This is not going to get presented to the board until next year. Okay, so if if that's the case, then do we want to do we want to have this come back and look at that language? The only thing is, we have a lot of things coming back. I mean, the the work plan is yeah. very delayed right now at this point. Um, right. So I think I'm in favor of just moving it forward, knowing there's the two issues that are going to be, or the three changes that are going to be made in the document, just to keep something moving forward. And I don't think anything we're proposing is particularly controversial, even with the changes. So that's my suggestion. So if I understand, Catherine, it would it's still coming back to us with the, but it's going to be for approval with those modifications. It's not coming back to the rules committee. It's oh, it's going to the full commission. The, oh, okay. my, my motion was to recommend that this go to the, that we're recommending approval by the commission with the three changes, because I just worry at some point at the end of the year, we're going to have so much, <laughs> the commission's going to have so yeah. much, right? So, and I feel like we have a agreement in, in substance, so. All right, the three changes, just to confirm, are the confidentiality, the vexatious litigant, and then what's the third one? The executive committee, unless it's a- um, Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like okay. harmonizing with rule, harmonizing with rule three, three points. Three points. Yeah. Yeah. Six, nine, one. Okay, so I don't need to make that change right now. You do not. I'm not yeah. trying to I, do it on, on the fly. The fly I, I feel like I want you all to have, be able to do yeah. it properly, just, so. I would say in the motion, this is with the changes to um, edit I to form up to harmonize between the executive committee being the decider under this rule and um, terminations, you know, being decided by the commission under 3.691. Okay, so with Brady's amendment to what I originally said, <laughs> can someone ask for a second? I'll second. Great, I'll do roll call vote. Um, Asaraf? Yes. Right, Master Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. O'Shelley? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Motion passes. And so let me talk to Brady and Erica offline to see if it's possible. I, I think it might not be possible because Brady's doing like six other things for us for the June meeting. Um, so yeah. Um, it, it might need to wait until another meeting this year. But like I said, it's not going to really impact the, the work plan because it's this can't go to the board until next year anyways. Man, so this this process is so long. To get... I apologize, but it's, it is a good process. No, to you don't have to apologize. It, yeah. We're just in this like weird zone where we've like, we're like, yeah, we really like this rule, but we can't operate under it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't. Why can't it, this this piece go to the board sooner? Because they're requesting, um, well, with our advice, that, that wow. we're going to start out with foundational pieces so they have an understanding okay. of IOLTA funding, eligibility, mm -hmm. and then we're going to build on top of that all, all the nuances. It'll be just be a better process for them. Got it. Thank you. So I'm going to apologize. I have another meeting at two that I have to go to. So um, oh. again, I'm going to miss your great presentation. 
Thank you so much, Catherine. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Um, I mean, we're on the second agenda item, and this is um, a, a Dan's the lead staff on this working group. And we apologize that the, the working group was not able to come up with a firm recommendation. This, this issue is pretty complicated, and you're going to hear why in a second. But um, Dan and the working group are going to kind of present kind of the issue and some preliminary thoughts. I just wanted okay. to let everyone, I have to jump off. I'm, I'm going to the board meeting, speak of the devil. So. Um, Talk to y'all. Send <laughs> more regards, Brady. <laughs> Take care. Uh, okay, Dan. Hi, and... everybody. Um, do you have uh, my screen being shared? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Dan. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for. Oh your my patience. gosh, am I the only working like rules committee person not on this working group on this call? <laughs> I guess I'm mean too. <laughs> you, you and me. Well, we have to give you a break, Erica. You were on three, uh, like three. No, I, I'm not <laughs> asking to be on it. I just, and, and when Catherine, I saw the list, I was like, oh, <laughs> I mean, Catherine, I are the only ones who don't know what's going on. Catherine, Catherine was the other person who I was really hoping yeah. to get some input from. Uh, <laughs> well, but fine. this is still uh, important. Um, and we yes, needed yes. three people to support me uh, because. It turns out that this little issue has a lot of ramifications and it's involved in a lot of different things. So this memo has definitely taken longer than we expected it to. Uh, and here's partly why. Here's what we're gonna talk about. And today's goal isn't to um, approve anything, but to make sure that the working group is on the right track, that uh, we're thinking of the same questions that you are and when we release this to LAC, we're not asking for any trouble we don't expect. Our agenda is uh, first, what are legal uh, law school clinical programs? Uh, what are the requirements specific to them? And, and what kind of complication issues do those raise? Uh, and what are the complication requirements or issues relating to the things that law school clinical programs have to do that, that every QLSP has to do, but they're having a special problem with it. And then uh, there's a, a third kind of topic about administrative costs that isn't specific to law school clinical programs, except to the extent that they are um, disproportionately impacted by them, you might say. They're, um, this is an issue that, that tends to um, come up more uh, significantly with the law school programs than with the others. So uh, what are law school clinical programs? We have seven of them currently getting grants. And um, I believe that our new applications are only for six of those because Chapman uh, has dropped out of the program. But uh, we've had others in the past. And part of the goal of this process is to see if we can grow this group, uh, the rules, for these organizations don't currently encourage them to participate and kind of make it difficult to know how. So um, currently there's only six and um, some of the largest schools in California aren't on this list. Um, although I will mention that East Bay Community Law Center isn't a law school clinical program, but it is the clinical program for, um, for Berkeley Law School, uh, it's just been spun off into its own um, nonprofit. But these, th this is our universe that we're talking about. And the first uh, issue that comes up with respect to them is uh, part of their definition. You'll see here at the top arrow that I have a number one. We've only got numbers one through nine. So it, it's, we can see the horizon from here. Um, Law school clinical programs by statute must have been operated for at least two years. Um, oh, sorry. Well, I just want to highlight it, but I can't do that. Uh, I've got it in bold anyway. Uh, two years at a cost of $20,000. And the question has come up how to measure that two year period. Several years ago, the um, commission determined that uh, it ended when they made their decision. And on that basis, a program that hadn't fulfilled its two years at that point was not found eligible. Um, the working group looked at, at that kind of common law and 
uh, thought that a better um, ending date for that two year period would be when applications are due. So they've actually got the records necessary um, for review. The idea being that this requirement of operating for two years um, implies uh, a responsibility to make sure that there were two solid years in there of real operations. Um, and that those records would actually require them to produce the audited financial statement, which is part of the application anyway, but they'd need one for the prior year as well. Um, this does build a kind of a lag into entry into the process, into this system, um, except that by putting it in the statute, or in the rule and making it transparent, programs would know about it and be able to anticipate it and, and, and prepare for it. Whereas what's happening now is they don't know about it, submit an application, it isn't approved and they don't get in at all. They don't come back. Um, so while this does build in some extra time and we've talked about whether having extra time is a good thing or not, in this case, extra time might be a good thing uh, because we want these grantees to be uh, stable, viable, ongoing organizations and not just sort of flash in the pan changes in the curriculum. Uh, Will, do you, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, I, normally I'd hold till the end of the presentation, but I know we have so many complicated issues. I just wanted to raise the point that my understanding is that means it could be four years before they get actual money from the bar, from, when, from the start of their program. You know, if they started in the summer and then they get the two audits in and then they can finally apply and then it goes through the process and then they get the money. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and it depends on when their fiscal year is. Um, so, you know, if it ends at, the, at an inconvenient time, then they could be waiting for a period after that. Uh, so, yes, there's a lot of padding in this. So I, I think we're we're handcuffed by the statute that says two years, but I did want to make everyone aware of that because that was, it just feels a little disappointing. But as long as, but we should, we should give as much notice as possible, but that, that is the reality. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Um, and uh, also, Will's um, on target with raising questions as they come up. Uh, in the end, uh, there are nine recommendations being tentatively launched. And this says recommendation, but it, it should say tentative uh, because we're looking for ways to strengthen them or shape them. And if any of the directions we're going don't make sense, this is a good time to talk about it. Um, if there's nothing else to talk about on this one though, um, I'm gonna move to another part of the same definition uh, for legal services, <laughs> law school clinical programs. Uh, in their definition at section 6213 A2A, it says that they have to be operating as an identifiable law school unit, which is not a defined term at this point. We have certain criteria that we have looked at historically, uh, distinct administrative, administrative structure, um, specific uh, distinctive facilities, um, fiscal segregation, um, and in particular, uh, we've required uh, law school clinical applicants to provide uh, an audited statement of their own clinical expenditures. Um, this is gonna come up again uh, when we talk about audits, which is a, a common requirement for all QLSPs. But um, because these organizations sometimes submit the audit prepared for the law school, that law school audit doesn't always have a special schedule of the clinical program's expenditures. And when that has been the case, uh, the determination has been that this doesn't meet our requirements for an audit and the application couldn't be accepted. Um, so that's a sort of a, a crypto requirement that we haven't publicized, we haven't made clear, but it's absolutely critical for our ability to evaluate the application in the same way as we look at all the other QLSPs. 
Hi, uh, Erica, you have your hand up? Yes, sorry. I am gonna take you up on your offer to ask questions as we go. One question I, I have on this is, you, you sort of mentioned wanting to grow this program and you surveyed the people, the, QL, the LSCPs that we currently have. Are these uh, identifiability factors, ones that are true of ones that we don't currently fund? And are these, is, is, should there be any adjustment to them to grow the program? Or do we think these are really necessary for like oversight? Um. That's a great question. And Jim Meeker actually just had a conversation with um, some of the administrators at the UCI clinical program, which does not meet some of these criteria. They don't have a, a distinct uh, and, and specific location. Um, and I don't know how their expenses are segregated, but their audit doesn't break them out. And the question is whether all law school clinical programs should qualify for this, or if we're really talking about a law school clinical program that is kind of more specific and identifiable. This was written in you know, 1981, so clinical programs didn't look like they do now, but this seems to anticipate something that is kind of specific. When we did the survey and through years of doing site visits, I would say that all of them have been identifiable, but not always in the same way. Um, there's, there's different language they use. There's different ways that the fiscals are set up. The one baseline we can't do without is the audited financial statement of their revenues and expenditures. Beyond that, what we've typically done, to be honest, is we'll come back from a monitoring visit and say, yeah, it's identifiable, and here's why we thought so. And, and we would list all the things that we saw, uh, but there wasn't any specific set of criteria for us to check against. So what we saw turned into those criteria. Could, could um, I add some context to that, Dan? Yes, please. I mean, it, um, just to date myself, I entered law school in 75 and there weren't clinical programs at that time, but since then there's been a lot of development of it. And my understanding over time is that a lot of law schools developed sort of a caste system. That is, it was the academic faculty versus the clinical faculty, and which created certain internal political issues. I do know some of the newer schools that really want experiential learning as part and essential to the curriculum, like Irvine, which is a fairly new school. They specifically designed it so that the faculty are all integrated. So the clinical faculty are not in a specific location. They're interspersed with the rest of the other faculty. Uh, the same thing with meeting clients. A lot of the clients are met in faculty's offices, which were interspersed or with other meeting rooms. So some of these schools have had a conscious effort to merge the clinical program with the academic. So there's not an identifiable difference in terms of organizational structure, just to add a point. Thank you. Oh, hi, Will. What's up? I think that's really helpful information. I, I think I would, I generally like this definition as all of these being indicators, um, except for perhaps the identifiable and dedicated location. That doesn't feel like it, it really makes it very clear because of, of what Jim was saying, like it can be spread out. But I do think um, we want to have clear res responsibility, like somebody needs to own it. Um, and that if, if somebody doesn't own it, then nobody owns it kind of thing. Um, and that clinical director speaks to that. Um, and also separating out expenses and, and keeping track of time, I think speaks to that. So that would be my feedback. I don't know how to fit it in. Necessarily. Are, are, are you saying that, that, that maybe a clinical director is also a, a, a necessary but not sufficient criterion? It would be an indicator. Uh, you know, okay. I, yeah. Okay. I think um, that's where I, I sit, that somebody has to own that responsibility very clearly, like mm -hmm. an individual or a small group. And, it, and it, may be, it may be something different than necessarily clinical director. It may be associate dean of experiential learning who's in charge of the clinical program. So, I mean, you know, yeah. the, the terminology, the organization, 
needs to be liberally construed, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that it's captured. The title part is captured. So thank you, Dan and everyone. Selena? Well, I think it's also helpful to go back to legislative intent in, in including law school clinics here. You know, the purpose of this funding is to help low income people by providing free legal services to them. Um, and so when there is a, a program that has a lot of academics mixed in with a clinical program, it just makes it harder to determine which is this funding supporting free legal services or is this going into like, you know, the, the academic learning portion, which is important, but is not the purpose of this funding. And so to the extent that, um, and Jim and I have talked a lot about this, about that there needs to, there needs to be more funding for clinical programs because Chap, Chapman showed that they closed their program um, you know, to make, to streamline it as clearly as possible. So clinics know that they're applying for the right thing. And if they have a program that they could easily change the structure a little bit to be qualified for funding, it needs to be clear to them what they can do. Um, speaking only from my own experience, the clinical programs I did was a true mixture of academics and clinical programs. And I think I had X number of hours of clinical credit and X number of hours of academic required classes I had to take with the clinic. Um, and my school didn't need funding for that, but maybe there are others that could um, separate the types of learning so that it could be a separate identifiable, a, identifiable unit. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And just like, for example, you wouldn't wanna use this funding to fund your standard first year con law course. It's not related to delivery legal services, but I did talk to, uh, let's see, when I went through the uh, McGeorge school, I mean, they had like a bankruptcy clinic and there was a course associated with the bankruptcy clinic. And before you could take the bank, be in the bankruptcy clinic, you had to take that course, which was taught by the same instructor who supervised the clinical work. I think that kind of academic requirement is linked with the delivery of legal services. But, but I think these law schools should be able to articulate in their curriculum what, what parts related to the clinical program and what parts not. Well, I, I, I think uh, first we're, beginning to embrace a new topic, which is the definition of legal services and how the law school's overall work fits into that. But I also wanna make sure that Pamela's raised hand um, uh, gets a chance to uh, be acknowledged. No, that just, my, my comment was just gonna be regardless of where the location is, um, what has to be identifiable uh, will still be the services that are, that are offered, um, the location, the persons there were eligible. So those things are not gonna go away. Um, there has to be that, that factor of eligibility and that has to be separated out as, as, as others were saying from the bigger picture, which is the law school. Um, we, they're clear on their directives, but in terms of the clinic, that still has to be um, separated out and accounted for budget-wise. Beautiful seg, beautiful segue. Thank you so much. Um, that is, I think the next thing we're gonna talk about, but um, my, before I move to the next slide, I just wanna take a quick temperature check. It sounds like we're on the, in the right ballpark, if not even like on the right base with regard to everything except for maybe an identifiable and dedicated location. Uh, but that um, the idea of setting a baseline and some criteria uh, is helpful and constructive it at least give people a path and a sense of where the path is. I, I have one question on that. We yes. also use the phrase dedicated staffing. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like under what Selena and Jim have described, they didn't have staff dedicated solely, is how I interpret that phrase, to clinical work. Um, should, should the recommendation be that it, they have solely dedicated staffing? I, I was thinking that the phrase dedicated staffing had that implication that they would have like a personnel line where there was somebody who was in charge of their admin and somebody in charge of their, you know, whatever else they've got that the ED is being charged to the clinic. Uh, hi, Juan, do you have a response? Yeah, you know, I don't think practically speaking, though, we want to limit the, the, at least the my law school, my experience with the law school going on monitoring visits, like a lot of the attorneys, um, the supervising attorneys or the director of the program is also like 
half their time is um, at the university at large. And so if you make solely, it, it, it's okay. not really in line with the structure. I wasn't, sorry, I, I misinterpreted it. Okay. I interpreted it as saying solely dedicated, like dedicated staffing means solely dedicated to the- Oh yeah, I don't I don't think we intended that, right, Dan? The no, no, they're not solely my misinterpretation. Okay. Partial yeah. FTEs are good. Partial okay. FTEs are good. But yeah, they have a lot of partial FTEs. Sorry, <laughs> I, I misinterpreted that, yeah. go ahead. Um, okay. Um, Moving to um, some of the questions of corporate structure, which are involved with all, all QLSPs. Um, we'll start from the really simple ones. Uh, part of the application process, part of the eligibility process involves demonstrating that you are an eligible organization. And we require in our guidelines that organizations provide our couples, copies of their articles of incorporation and the letters they get from the IRS and the Franchise Tax Board that say you are a nonprofit entity. Um, the uh, guidelines actually specify for law school clinical programs that because they're not part of, they're not their own organization, they can submit those, org those documents on behalf of the law school. And that's been really helpful because frequently that information is not easily available. Having that be part of our database has been great, and we would like that just to be codified instead of in a non-codified guideline. The other thing that's in the guideline that we're not as crazy about is a requirement that um, applicants provide a certificate of status, which is um, a certificate issued by the Secretary of State for $50 that says, as of this moment, this, is, this organization is in good standing. But you can actually go to the Secretary of State's website and pull that data without having it certificated. Uh, and it's perfectly valid and much easier to get. So we would rather just have that requirement be part of the application. It doesn't even need to be codified. But since we're talking about codifying a couple of the guidelines, that's when we didn't want to codify. Um, before I move to another page, uh, does that make sense? Um, this one's more challenging. <laughs> and on the uh, table of, of the agenda, I should say, this item was in blue because we don't have a recommendation, we have a question. Um, all QLSPs that don't get funding through LSC or OAA must meet the requirements of section 6214B, which um, lay out a bunch of different things. One of which is $20,000 of cash funds from other sources to support free legal representation. And the question for law schools is um, when the law school itself gives funding to its clinical program, does that count? And there are two positions. Uh, the language of the statute seems to be ambiguous. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to turn to Jim, uh, who I think was the more most articulate proponent of the of the pro position. But uh, in short, I think it's that this money came from the community. The community wants to support the law school. The law school's got the clinic. What more do you want? What, what, one point of clarification, Dan. My argument was that if the law school used funds from its endowment fund, not just any funds, not like say the funds they get from the regents or from the parent university, but from their endowment funds. Endowment funds are basically community contributions, either from alumni or other law firms or other organizations, but that's money donated specifically to the law school. That if the law school then decides to take some of the money, like $20,000, and then allocate it specifically to the clinical programs, to me, that's community support for the law school that's being used for clinical purposes. Okay, but it's endowment funds, only endowment funds, not just any other budgeted funds. So, so what about if the law school has its own fundraising program, and they just have a community fundraiser for the law school generally, and they raise $100,000 and they give $20,000 to the clinical program. Would, would that the same analysis hold? I would think so, yes. Okay. 
Yeah. So, so it, it, it's just the question of whether these are funds donated from an outside source to the law school or whether these are funds generated by the university for the law school. Right, or fees, tuition, yeah. or money yeah. from so, the state. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Will, hand. I guess, uh, I know we've reviewed this and my understanding is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the 20K in the statutory language is a way of demonstrating community support for the program. And that's the purpose. We read it that way, but it doesn't necessarily say that. That's an inference that we're drawing. So we don't, the, the legislature said, hey, they gotta have 20K from other sources, but we're not entirely sure why they felt that was important other than our guess is demonstrated community support, right? Yes, I mean- the, 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 It's the such statute, a weird requirement to me. <laughs> the statute lays it out just like this, one, two, three. You know, for law school clinical programs, they already have to have been in operation for at least two years with this level of expenditures. Uh, but now it has to be from other sources to support free legal representation. And, um, the, the, the historic practice has been not to count the law school funding, um, kind of for two reasons. The, the first is that um, the clinical program uh, is not, or well, the law school is not an other source from the clinical program. But you know, Jim has pointed out the money is not really coming from the law school, it's coming from a community perhaps. Uh, the, um, the second reason is that uh, it's not clear that the funding was provided to support free legal representation. And that's where a real interpretation question comes in. Um, someone who you know, gives a $100,000 gift to the law school may not have the clinic in mind in particular. Is that relevant? Should the gift or the funding have been provided specifically to support free legal representation? Or can it have just been provided and then be used to support free legal representation. Our interpretation has been the former, that the money should be provided for the, the qualified purpose, but that's an inference. I, oh, sorry. I mean, as his hand raised, I'll raise no, my hand. No, go ahead, Erica. I'll, I'll jump in after you. So to me, I mean, I understand the community support thing, but to me, this just says like, can you fundraise, right? <clears throat> like you could go get, I don't know. Like we, we tell them that they have to be an identifiable unit. And then we say that, and you have to have separate audits and yet you're still part of the law school. So the money from the law school doesn't count. Like that's weird to me. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm not totally understanding some of the nuances here. I, I also, and I, I, I understand staff has like a practice, so feel free to like correct my misinterpretations on this. But um, my my inclination is, if you're an identifiable unit and you get the law school funding you, like the law school is the donor, not the donor. Does that make sense? Like, like they are deciding to give their money for free legal services. Does it? If it, if it wasn't a restricted donation originally, like if somebody in the community says, here's $50,000 for you to give to the clinical program and it comes through the law school, then I would say that that probably is, that would count. But if somebody gives $50,000 to the law school and the law school then decides to give to the clinical well, why does it matter? Like, what if the what if there's no donation? Like, what if the law school is just like, hey, we think it's important to provide free legal services to our community, and we're going to do it with like a clinic, and we're going to set aside, you know, fifty thousand dollars for two years. What? Why? Why does it matter that they didn't go get it outside? If if the law if the clinic is an identifiable unit, I guess, that's that's the part I don't understand. That's the question, really. Um, okay. 
uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I share Erica's confusion a little bit, I guess. I'm, I'd be curious if there's any sort of more context that we can get about why this exists, because in my mind, there could be a few different reasons, but one of them, it seems to me, I think Erica alluded to this, you know, if, if it's about whether the organization can, um, you know, either, either can fundraise or can run without IELTA support, um, then, then does it matter where it's coming from as long as it's just funds that are not like our funds that are going to that organization? And it seems to me like if we're sort of, and, and, and again, I, same, same sort of thing, like if I'm missing something here and if there's some, some other overriding interest, I'd please correct me, but it seems to me like we're, it's, it's this sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's very small, specific sort of hoops to jump through. Why, why do we need those if we can sort of say like there is funding that's coming from, out, from outside of this particular program, the particular clinic, um, why, why do we need to restrict where it's coming from or, or sort of, and, and I've got a whole bunch of people with hands up, so this is good. Hopefully we'll get, uh, maybe, maybe I can ask Dwan to, to chime in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, this this one is a, a technical cleanup. I don't think like at least the staff, staff perspective, we feel strongly one way or another. I mean, Dan and I inherited this kind of structure of like the office practice not counting, um, I think the university's donation. And I think some of that feels like because they're they're technically not a different organization. But again, the staff position is we don't feel strongly. We do, we do want clarity for pro programs. This isn't something I think should be that contentious. I think um, we should do what makes sense, but I, I don't, I agree with, um, I think Amin and Erica's sentiment, like why have a hurdle? My, my, my vote would be to make, to be flexible. This isn't really the contentious issue for law school. I think for the law school clinical program, the two big issues right now are, are defining identifiability, just so that there's clarity within, um, you know, uh, California law, uh, law school clinical programs, whether they can apply or not. Um, I, I, I don't know if I quite agree with how Dan the, we want to expand this program. I, I think that might, maybe, or maybe not. I think more of, um, we want the clarity around this and then if they can apply, they can apply. And then I think the other issue that Dan and, and the work group is gonna talk about is this issue of um, indirect costs. That is a big, big sticking point. I don't think this one is a sticking point. I do think we want we want to come out one way or another. Um, we don't, again, the staff positions, we don't feel that strongly. So what Dan described was the office practice that we have inherited. It does feel like a, a, a hoop, though. Um, Will? Yeah, I think I'm convinced uh, that uh, this is not the best use of staff time, splitting these hairs. And the broadest definition is appropriate, given the other requirements, such as the, the qualified legal services, that they are focusing on that piece, of providing services to the indigent, free legal representation. Once they've hit that, I, I think we don't need so many um, hoops. So I, I'm, that's where I'm coming down so far. Maybe somebody else convinces me otherwise, but I think the broader definition is appropriate. Thank you. You have a lot of uh, company so far, uh, Selena. <laughs> Um, my only comment is if we were trying to figure out what was meant by the $20,000, I think it's going to be really hard to find legislative intent. Um, with the with this bill in particular, I think there was a lot of, you know, negotiation around what would qualify for IELTS funded program purposes. Um, and so I think we could, you know, we, we shouldn't worry too much about what legislative intent was, but I, I would guess that it's basically to make sure that IELTS funding is not the sole source of funding. Because um, this was passed long before Equal Access Fund, it was passed um, long before the state bar was administering all these other funds. And I suspect it's just, you know, if you lose your IELTA funding, are you going to have to shut your doors? And also, if your IELTA fund grants are delayed, are you going to have to not pay your staff? So I would imagine it's just like, do you have enough funding to keep your doors open if the state bar is late? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Jim? Uh yeah, I just wanted to add that I, I don't think this is particularly unique to law school clinic programs. I think we talked about uh, the Orange County Children's Hospital. It was a program that we funded at one point, and then we stopped because they couldn't meet this $20,000 requirement, because I would imagine most donors 
to the Orange County Children's Hospital or uh, is or Children's Hospital of Orange County are donating to the entire operation of the hospital, not to any one particular program. Mm -hmm. and, and two, it also, I don't know about you, but my law school is asking me every year for money. They don't say we're going to use the money for the clinics or we're going to use the money for foreign exchange students or we're going to use the money for something else. They just want money. And indeed, most law schools, the way they're set up, there is an associate dean for advancement whose job is to raise money. He doesn't work just for the clinic. He works for the entire law school. So in generating community support for the law school. So to me, I see this as meeting the community support requirement. Okay. It sounds like maybe we're kind of aligned that it's the broader, the, the, it's the yes, they meet the funding. Yeah, uh, again, I was gonna try to highlight it uh, and yeah, no, every no, time no, I touch good. it, it disappears, but. Um. <laughs> and Dan, I just wanna do a time check. We have about half an hour. Um, yeah. I would love for you to get to indirect costs because I think- Yeah, the, the, the next, the next uh, couple of pages are really quick. This was, I think the hardest question we've got, uh, but I'm glad we got it resolved. Um, audit requirement, uh, we're gonna get through this really, really fast. Uh, we've already talked about, um, these organizations they need to submit an audit. These are the statute and the rule that require it. And um, we just want to um, add that not only as an element of identifiability, as we mentioned before, but also to the rule specific to audits in the state bar rules saying that um, an LSCP must provide an audited statement of its own clinical expenditures and revenues uh, regardless of whether it submits an audit on its own or from the law school. Um, the key being that this criterion needs to be front and center, not just for the identifiability issue, but also uh, for uh, the audit issue. Um, this looks ugly, but everything in a box is a wait, statute. Wait, wait, sorry, wait. can we go back to the other one? Yeah. So, so right now we don't, technically require that we require it as office practice, but it's not codified. Is this like a barrier for law schools to be able to do, to be able to apply? Is being able to do the audit of their own stuff? Well, what's um, proposed is of the more flexible, the more flexible. So we, we have them submit right now, the office practices, the audit by the university at large, and then the schedule has to be of the, of the clinical program has to be audited. So it's a little bit of a workaround because they cannot get an audit. So, well, I, I should, I shouldn't say that. Uh, some some clinical programs have said they cannot get an audit for just the clinical program because it's not their own separate 501c3. Got so it. it's a workaround. So this is a technicality. I don't think there's controversy really. Um, this is what we've, we've been doing for many, many years. So this is to codify that that is truly allowable. So they're gonna provide independently audited statements of their own revenues and expenditures. Well, well whatever audit they submit, has to include a schedule of their own. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so if they if they include the one of the law school, as long as there's a schedule that's yeah. audited, that's fine. It, okay, it's sorry, the I just university got gets audited, and then there's a separate schedule for just the clinical program. Perfect. And we need that because um, it's itemized to the expenditures, and then then we connect it to their expenditures. Again, okay. this is really I, I just, a technicality. I, I, it's a it's a, a workaround because they're not their own five one c three. There's no controversy. This yeah, no, no, no. I, it's no problem. I I thought you were requiring heightened. No, 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 no. Oh no, 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 no. sorry, no. sorry, um, sorry. But it has been a barrier because it hasn't been well known. So there are organizations that applied and didn't know this was a requirement. So um, yeah. they didn't get through. They should have known, and now they can. Got it. Perfect. Um, Great. Primary purpose and function. This is the question that came up earlier about whether law school clinical programs are purely organizations that deliver legal services or if they also have an educational component. And that first box up there is the language from the definition in section 6213. Other QLSPs have a primary purpose, have that provide as its primary purpose and function, civil legal services. When I read that language, it implies a single primary purpose and function. But A2 for law school programs uses different language that has a slightly different implication. It doesn't say it expressly, but by saying a primary purpose and function of providing civil legal services, I think that the statute acknowledges that some of what they do is educational. 
Law school clinical programs do have an educational function. And most of our rules don't acknowledge that. And the question is, um, to what extent should they? Um, the other boxes that I've got here, hold on just a second. Hey, Dan. Yeah, hi. On this one, do you think we should, uh, because of the limited time, mm -hmm. just note that it's gonna go to the legal services working group and we'll come back to it? Would that be appropriate or do you wanna cover it all? Um, I think that that's probably appropriate. Let me wrap up what I was saying okay. uh, and, uh, and move on. Um, there is no recommendation here from our working group to change the primary purpose rule, use a grant funds rule, the grant allocation statute is already statutory. We're not gonna to touch that. But if the rule about definition of legal services recognized that um, there's education and training that might be included and required as part of a clinical practice program, that would limit the educational component to the thing that's actually delivering services. And, um, and that working group is gonna discuss how to fit that into a, uh, a more comprehensive definition of legal services than we have cited here in the second box, which is very terse. So uh, in the interest of time, let me uh, move to administrative costs because um, this is something that it does address uh, or impact all organizations, uh, but particularly law schools uh, because law schools sometimes charge their clinical programs for administrative support uh, at a higher rate than most comparable QLSPs would pay. Not always, but sometimes. And when their admin goes up so steeply, they actually get an advantage in grant funding. Um, so the commission wants to make sure that the actual costs of managing a project are covered, including the administrative costs, but it also wants to make sure that uh, there's no unfair advantage, that grant funds do get used primarily to deliver services. So we have two rules that both establish the same standard, reasonable, which I, it, it, it's not really a standard, they just kick the can and let us figure it out. For primary purpose and function, determining eligibility, um, two law school clinical programs had such high administrative costs that they have agreed to limit those on their uh, application to 30% of the personnel costs. Uh, Duan was involved in the conversations with those organizations in 2018, but um, that was a number that was agreed to be reasonable at the time uh, between these two organizations independently and the state bar. And um, it's still in effect, but it isn't something that's been promulgated. This is one of our standards for saying what's reasonable. Anything above 30% of personnel we thought wasn't. And just to take a short diversion, these organizations are paying for their administrative costs through an indirect cost allocation, a single payment for all indirect costs. And we don't know what those consist of. We are presuming up to whatever is reasonable, that it's reasonable, but we don't actually know. We kind of need to set a standard and say, above this, we have questions, below this, we don't. But we're not in a position to ask a lot of questions right off the bat. Uh, so 30% of personnel work for eligibility um, for those two organizations. The other standard we're using is for um, all organizations, once they've gotten grants and they submit a budget for how those funds are gonna be spent. Uh, the budget has to, or may include reasonable administrative expenditures and our office practice has been up to 25% of the grant can be admin. If it's higher than that, the commission needs to give approval. If it's less than that, staff will approve it. We don't ask for backup information. It's, it's presumptively reasonable. These are the two standards we use. 30% of personnel and 25% of the total. And we'd like to narrow it down to one standard that makes sense in all cases. 
Dan, can I give a little bit context on, on the, the two law school and why there's a, a separate like um, standard for them? Of course. Back to the other slide. So the, the, we have two law schools that for a number of years, their indirect cost ratio was in the range of 40, 50%, something like that. It was very, very large. It, it, it stood out to us. Um, there was some staff changeover and they had said to us, you know, this is the kind of the negotiated agreement. You guys have agreed to this for a number of years. This predated a lot of us. So at that time, um, we we said, okay, well, if that's, can you, can you itemize it for us? Because it needs to, even if it's indirect costs, right, or overhead or administrative costs, whatever the terminology you want to use, we need to be assured that it ties back to the provision of free legal services because that's our statutory kind of mandate. Um, they went back to try to work with their university and the university um, couldn't, I, I'm not sure if it was could not or would not itemize it, um, but they said that, you know, this is like, th this is what it costs to kind of support these type of programs. So we weren't able to get an itemized um, line item with that 40 or 50 percent was so it felt really uncomfortable because we knew as part of that that cost there were going to be things like beautification of the uh, uh, the campus or uh, recruitment retention of like um, students in general the cost that would not be could not be directly tied to the cost of the clinical program itself so because of that we said okay we can't accept 40 50 percent um and then and then there was this negotiated 30 percent it, and this has always felt really com uncomfortable because two law schools are able to kind of take advantage of this. Um, not all law schools know about it. And then on top of that, not all programs know that this is, this is like a standard. So we have felt really uncomfortable for a number of years. And this is why this, this issue really needs to get tackled because it's an equity issue at this point in terms of not just law school, but, but having it for like all QSPs. And then there's also an uncomfortableness that we say 30% is, is reasonable and it does feel like, okay, that, that, you know, we have other programs, not just law school clinical programs that have an admin ratio of 30 per, 30%. It's not unreasonable, um, but they, they can't, they can't track it back completely to, to like each um, the expenditures for um, civil legal services. We think it, they probably, there is probably some mechanism, but they haven't been able to provide it to us, but there is an uncomfortableness because it's just, we haven't negotiated and the commission approved this. So it's not like a staff, the commission is aware of this. It was approved, and I, I can't remember what Dan said, 2018, 2019. But you know, it was approved then, but it goes back to Lorna and I think the early 20 teens. Uh, Erica? Okay, sorry. I just need to recount what's happening to make sure I'm understanding the situation. So yeah. please bear with me for a of minute. Course, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay. So for pr to determine their like eligibility, <clears throat> they need to have 75% or more going to free legal services, right? In order to show primary purpose. And we are allowing in that 75%, 30% of that 75% for these two law schools can be administrative. But for well, everybody else- of the personnel. 30% of their, well, what's, sorry. Yeah, I guess so, we're getting- so, Right, uh, so, so- I know, it doesn't match. It's, it's very confusing. So there's program costs and then admin costs, and they right. both consist of personnel and non-personnel components. Right. So, so this is 30% of the program personnel costs, I, and I didn't okay. put in program because so, it's too so, much. So let me say, okay. So like in their costs to expenses for going towards free legal services, a percentage of that's personnel. And then 30% of that we're allowing these universities to count a percentage of their, what we know is their personnel going to free legal services to be their like administrative. I, I, I think it'd be more fair to say that they, they look at their audited financial statements and see what their personnel costs, non-personnel costs and administrative costs were. And when their administrative costs are more than 30% of their personnel costs, they just lop off the extra and don't count it for purposes of eligibility or allocations. Okay. An allocation to because that's to me the little bit of the more important part. Yeah, I was going to say it, it, okay. it goes to the grant award. Yes. So, but for everyone else, what do we allow? Um, well, we haven't seen these kind of really high numbers from other organizations, so we haven't 
imposed a, another standard. Well, well, Dan, actually, this is the 25, 75% personnel, non-personnel. So we, we say there are suggested percentages in the application. Well, Again, this is not codified. This is just office well, well, practice. No, that, that, that's, that's, that's in the budget, but in the application. We, I, I know, but this is also the, the, the budget and the, the allocation. So we let them budget for 75, 25%. Um, the, the, and then, and then if they if they exceed that, then it goes to the commission for review. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, to me, and maybe, and I'm sorry if I'm getting this is very oh, if no, I'm just getting going. overly confused. But I just want to make sure I'm understanding the numbers here. Mm -hmm. So essentially, in order to establish 75% primary purpose, within that 75% primary purpose, 25% of it can be administrative. The other 75 of that 75 needs to be personnel or whatever, direct costs. Is direct that right? Costs. Yes, yes. No, the primary purpose, the other 25% can be just even non-civil legal oh. service, non-qualifying, right? No, but, but you're, she's talking about the 75% of qualifying. 25% yeah, of the 75% qual Is that what you're talking about? Yes, well, 20, so there's, so there's two 25%. Percent. The first one is you don't, it's non-qualifying, it's over here. And then in the 75%, 25% of it can be administrative costs. And then the other 75 of the 75 must be like personnel. It, it's not a must, it's suggested. So if they, if they, if they, if they deviate sure. from the commission, yeah. But so those are the guidelines. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's so not codified, it's not even a guideline. It's guidance, but it's not a guideline just to be clear. But my, point is, like, there's two, my point is that there's two 25%. Like if there's a bar graph, Yep. 25 is non qual yep. is allowed to be non qualified and you could be primary purpose. And then yep. I understand between 25 and 50 or between 75 and 50, yep. we approve and below 50, we say it's not primary purpose, right? Yep. And then within that 25, we have interpreted the reasonable share of administrative and overhead expenses to be 25% of that whatever yep. primary yep. purpose amount mm -hmm. is. And the universities are like, actually, ours is more like 40 to 50%. And we've said, mm -hmm. okay, we'll let you get away with 30%, right? Is that yes, yeah, right. Yes, that's exactly at? right. Exactly okay. right. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure I understood yes. what was going on. No, it was it, it, it was it was perfectly uh put and and they can't account for that 30%. Like they can't tell you what is in that 30%. It's they just can't itemize they can it. They can't itemize it. I mean, I, I don't yeah. think that they're like disingenuous because you know, 30% is in the realm of 20, 30, even sometimes 35 is in the, the realm. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying any bad faith. I'm just saying like, because yes. it's charged from their university, they can't the university itemize it. isn't giving them like, it's this much for this, this much for this. Yeah, okay. Jim, Jim has hey, a, the uh, university can itemize it. So why we've, we've seen it before, right? What the university has been able to give us is like, you know, because they're they run a what is a hundred million dollar organization. Right. So within that, they can say of that hundred million dollar X percentages for beautification, X right. percentages for, but they can't draw that down to the clinical program. Yes. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. So Sorry. Directly, right? Directly. Thank you for letting me. No, 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 no. That's out. yeah. And yeah, I'm sorry, I'm taking exactly. a time, but it was helpful. It, it, it helped me too. And, and Jim, is, is, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I think part of the problem is that um, you have two different perspectives from universities. You've got the smaller universities, which we primarily have grants with, and you've got the larger, what are called R1 major research universities like yeah. UCLA, UC Berkeley and so on. And they approach grants differently. At the larger research universities, their job is research and most of their grant activity is from federal agencies. And they automatically, when I was getting grants from the Department of Justice, they would take 52% off the top for overhead, 52%. That money would go to the office of the president in Oakland, which would, in my day, they gave a disproportionate amount of the money to UCLA and UC Berkeley because they were considered the flagship campuses. Now, at least the overhead generated by Irvine goes to UCOP and you, what UCOP does it take, the office of the president, they give back to Irvine. The chancellor at Irvine gets this and he says, I'm gonna use a certain amount for libraries, a certain amount for maintenance and so on. And I will give the School of Social Ecology part of it. And it comes to the Dean and the Dean will sit there and say, what do I wanna do with this money? And the deans have absolute freedom of what they could do with it. And it doesn't necessarily have to go back to the grant, the, the principal investigator at all, at all. 
because they're in the research activity, they're not getting grants for delivery of services. We are giving grants for delivery of services, which is a completely different perspective. And although the smaller schools like uh, McGeorge had the freedom to manipulate things, you see sits there and says, hey, if you're getting federal money, it's gotta be 55%. If you're getting state money, it's gotta be, I think it's 30% now, or it was 25 and it's gonna go up to 30%. Some schools have some flexibility. I get different uh, feedback from different deans. Uh, when I was writing grants from um, uh, the Legal Aid Society of Orange County to fund a graduate student to do an evaluation of the program, I would jump through all the hoops of dealing with a 501c3 organization. We didn't have any overhead at all. We're talking about like four and $5,000 grants. But it's a lot of work to do that. And oftentimes the law schools aren't necessarily set up with the personnel to jump through all these hoops to get around what the standard rules are. And they're, they're stuck with them. So uh, well, they're not good rules. I didn't like it as a faculty member. I hated it. <laughs> Will, do you have a comment? Yeah, well, I just wanted clarification. So this rule that we're looking at would apply outside of law school programs to all programs? Yes. I think sure. what, I, what I suggested to Dan and, and, and the working group is like, this is in the context of law school because we're seeing the problem with the law school, but whatever rule you come up with, I think for an equity perspective needs to apply across all, yeah. all programs and our support centers, QSPs, not, not, not just law schools. And, and here's where I see kind of the difficulty. Okay. So um, you, you, got, you all can be like kind of, if you if you if you're flexible to the, the, the two these two law school programs and say sure whatever the new percentage or, or stick with thirty percent that that's reasonable but we're okay with you not being able to itemize it you're gonna have to be able to say that to all a hundred and one other programs yeah. and even if those programs didn't intend to now they are going to be claiming um, admin costs up to that thirty percent but if you want to be nimble of personnel. And not difficult, but if you wanted to 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 be um, <clears throat> so we can trace it back and you require these two particular uh, law school clinical programs to say, hey, you can only claim up to what you can track back to expenditures. They might not be able to claim any of that 30 percent. So I don't know. It, it's it, we've been struggling with this. We don't actually have a good a good. Thank you, Duan. Proposal I... for you. It is a let, 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 though, because it does implicate other programs. This, this does implicate a lot of programs. So I, I'd like very briefly, briefly to show how um, looking across like Los Angeles County, which was selected because it tends to have high costs. And we can look at a lot of different kinds of programs that theoretically face the same kind of situations. The actual administrative costs that they identified in their audits go between nine and 23%. So our 25% standard of total fits all of them. I also looked uh, for grantees that have indirect costs at the organizational level. There's not many of them because most organizations do their admin internally. They have their own staff, but some law schools and some bar association programs uh, do have indirect costs at the, at the organizational level. And the two that have the highest are already subjecting themselves to this haircut but the others all fit within the 25% standard. Um, we looked at some other options, like what they're doing with federal grants. It was super complicated and not well suited to our grantees or our administrative capacity. It would be really expensive to implement that. Um, some state grants and uh, some private foundations set a really low number, 5% uh, sometimes. And um, yeah. I can say that a lot of grantees have reported that their ability to bill the actual administrative costs of their work, sometimes even the costs that other funders don't cover, has been a lifesaver for them. Yeah. So this hard low ceiling doesn't seem like it meets the, the, the goals that the commission's previously been trying to achieve of, of complete funding. Uh, hi, Selena. Go for it. I went and looked at our own admin because I was curious if uh, smaller organizations like LAC were a smaller organization had um, admin at, at either end of the range. And I'm happy to report that we are 16.6% .6 for both last year and this year. 
So that one hundred percent average. <laughs> no, we're exactly average. So that does seem reasonable, even for smaller organizations, because one of my hypotheses would have been that smaller organizations have much higher administrative overhead costs. The, the, the thing I'm seeing from my research was that the highest numbers are in organizations with a lot of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, public council has a lot of um, admin costs, and then law schools have a lot of admin costs. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to hear questions uh, from Will. Well, I, recognizing the time constraint, I just want to really echo Duan's statement on equity. I think that's really important that everyone be able to take advantage of whatever rule we come up with. I don't have an answer on what the number should be, but uh, I, I really support the idea of equity. Thank you. Sure. And Erica? Yeah. Okay. So wait, I just want to see, are we, I want to get into like, what is, what are we trying to do here? Is it that we're trying to say you need to track? And and a cap, or are we so say both. It's the both questions. So do you, are right. you do you want us required to track back, and then is there going to be guidance or a cap or whatever a number? There right. is, there's really two two issues that have come up when you apply for grants. How much of your budget reasonably can be attributed to administration, and then when you get a grant, how much of it can reasonably be dedicated to administration? We'd like to use the same standard in well, both cases. But no, 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 no. That's that's not totally right, though, right? That that's budget versus qualified expenditures. But it seems to me like the actual question is: Can you itemize? Can you connect them? Or are you allowed sort of this lump sum? Right? Like that's another question. Mm -hmm. um, that's one well, question. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I think that you might be making a, a, a comment about the nature of indirect costs generally and whether they're a large number or a small number, if they can't trace it back, do we have a problem with that? And um, that is a well, question- Right now, am I correct in saying that like, you're allowing two law schools who can't trace it back to count 30% and you're allowed, but every other organization has to track it back and is under 25%. Is that right? No. Um, we, we're, we're good with indirect costs. If it goes over a certain level, we explore more. And when it's really high, we ask organizations to make a voluntary reduction. But that's only happened to two organizations and they're both law schools. No okay. other organizations had indirect costs that, that would have triggered a, a, a further review. Got it. So for every, every organization, as long as they're below 25%, you don't require them to like track that it that the administrative expenses actually go towards that, that that's true of legal services uh well the administrative we don't ask for itemized explanations of all their administrative costs in their in their application um if they say you know this is what our admin expenses were we accept them and we don't say well this is unreasonable explain to me why you know this board meeting was so much more expensive or why was this other you know, activity part of your admin when it should have been a program cost for something else. Um, we basically have set a, a standard for ourselves that at, at 25%, uh, okay. we don't look further is, is, is where we've been, whether it's indirect or, or itemized. Got it. So okay. we just need to come up with that number. Yes. Uh, well, and, I mean, and what Dan's describing isn't really codified. That's, that's the other thing. So if, if that's, if this, yeah. if you're, if you're in agreement with that, that framework, we, we need to codify it too, is the other. It, okay. It's by something that has evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jim? Yeah, um, I mentioned this before in our previous discussions and I would sure like to see clarification here. We're using different terms mm -hmm. to seem to mean the same thing. You're using indirect cost, you're using direct cost, which is I presume the opposite of indirect, you're using administrative costs, you're using personnel costs, and we're using overhead. And I would like to know via Venn diagram or whatever, mm -hmm. how do these terms overlap? Because they don't all seem to mean the same thing. And I don't see, think all organizations are including the same items in those definitions. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And this is something that I have talked to Dan about because our application is built around personnel, non-personnel, admin, non-admin. So either they we have to change how they're describing it to fit ours or change our framework because there's some overlap, but it's it's not, they're not identical terminology. And then our, our rules use the phrase administration and overhead. Our 
instructions define administration but don't define overhead and indirect costs don't appear anywhere but that's just that lump sum which i tried not to put into this material because it, it seems that if the number is reasonable at the end whether they can parse it out for us or not we don't have the resources to, to second guess if they came up with the with a good number then yeah. we've let it be a good number. What? Yeah, I guess indirect to what? Indirect to the provision of legal services? Uh, no, it would be, uh, for example, if you look at um, at public counsel's um, uh, mm -hmm. audited statement, you'll see that they have lines for salary for their administrative staff and they pay for their own landscaping and they paid for their own audit and they've got their own you know, legal counsel that they have to pay for. Um, a whole bundle of administrative costs right. as uh, together with you know board costs and and, and governance and that um, these organizations don't do those things themselves they they hire another organization to do all that for them and they pay them a lump sum so how much of it was legal how much of it was governance how much of it was audit we don't exactly know it was just what they got charged for everything they got so it's can I offer a little bit? Can I offer a little bit of clarity? Because um, yeah. we've been talking with our fiscal team about this too, because obviously they're, <laughs> you know, they understand the, the language and the stuff more. So what we've been told by by Michael, who you met, who is our senior financial analyst, is um, <coughs> overhead and overhead and indirect costs we can use interchangeably. And so, and that's as so overhead and indirect as opposed to direct. So direct are things like personnel costs, right? Things you can tie back. There's a direct cost for it. There's a, a line, um, and then indirect and overhead are the same. Yeah. That right. helps. So, so the difference between like paying a lawyer to provide legal services and paying for your lights to stay on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Or paying for the guy who cleans up all the offices and sure. and turns off the lights. Okay. I mean, I agree with Jim that like it seems like we need some definitions here, but. Uh, I, I, I see what you're saying and um, but that that's that's neither here nor there. It seems to me, I mean we don't have to make this now, but 25% seems like a good number and we just tell the other they can why what can we not, not just tell the schools like drop it to 25 and well it, but it even though actually, there's different there's different standards like a lot of qualifying organizations pay for the bar fees for their attorneys, right? Universities will never pay your bar fee. If you're, even if you're a clinical attorney, they just won't do it. So, okay. I mean, there's, I mean, that's why we need some clear, I need clear, I would like to have, I should say, like to have clarification of terminology so we can see how these organizations, where they're consistent, and where they're not, so that we could be a little bit more clear in terms of what we're allowing, what we're not. That makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, Venn diagram sounds like an easy way to start. So I, I, I'd like to draw one up. But before we get there, we only have a minute left. And I want to very briefly, very briefly, you have nine recommendations. We've talked about them all, but here are our next steps. And I just want to show you what's coming up next. We have to revise the draft memorandum to address what we've heard today and get it out to lack the community comments and get it back to incorporate those comments so that we can present it to the full committee on July 29th, which is not that far away. Uh, at that point, I don't know if it's going to go forward in August, but we need to get it to the commission. But we have a reasonably short timeline, and I wish to let you know that I'm not going to be part of it. I have what? resigned from the state oh. bar oh. and uh, retired. Sorry to hear that. I'm going. I'm going on retirement, my friends. That's not fair. Oh my gosh. Do so, it though. Good for you. Have a, so have a in fun line with that. Yeah, yeah, this one it gets tough. You're like, I'm out. Uh, at three Kinda, yeah. On the I, mean, I learned something. <laughs> so in, in light of Dan's impending retirement, his last day in the office is actually um in, in a few weeks. I don't know if we're gonna make that July. Can you go back to that slide, Dan? The July. Oh. Dan is the main staff person on this topic for July 29th. So we just don't know. I mean, I just don't we can't honest. contract him in for that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna miss you. I have loved getting to know you. I think my first introduction was you and Mr. Frank Butner. And that was a cool experience. So since he's retiring. Congratulations on retirement though. That's that's the yeah. ball.
since, since you're retiring, can't we make you a commissioner so you still have to keep yes! working on this? Yes. Um, I don't know if you can make me one if I don't submit an application. Uh, <laughs> and you can then be on our end where you, yes. you can then be listening yeah. to these. Oh, well, yeah. these. We'll be our boss well, um, <laughs> let, Let's say I, I, I'm, I'm pleased not to be ruling out any options at this stage of the game. <laughs> But the first option that I'm definitely making sure I do is taking some time off. I've been doing this for 20 years and it doesn't stop. I mean, the cycle is That's nonstop. True. So I'm going to take a summer vacation and then raise my head. Don't and see. forget about us. No, <laughs> no y'all are fine. You, you're in very good hands. Uh, but if anything comes up, I'm always happy to help. Well, I thank like you very much. Openness, you definitely flexibility. Yeah, you've definitely shepherded some difficult issues. I know you and yeah. I have done some pass-through stuff and some <laughs> exchange fund yeah. stuff, all the accounting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's like little technical diddles. Just tiny little things, you know. So I think I think what will happen is Jim, Pam, and Will, we'll probably have maybe one more meeting with Dan before he he, he leaves to kind of like put get it in a place because I, yes. I don't think that he's going to have time to like get the memo to the July right. meeting, but get it in a place that we can hand it off to another staff at some right. point. Um, and I think that's the best we can do with this topic. Yeah. Um, you know, there's another working group um, that uh, uh, that's met this morning that's working on um, carryovers and budget revision. They might be able to absorb the indirect cost piece of it, <laughs> maybe. That, Erica and Jim, are, we're, they're gonna listen to this today and then, and then let me know afterward and then maybe we do I'm feeling even better the- about our decision to take on more right Jim like- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Erica Jim if you have initial thoughts you can email me separately I don't mean to put you on the spot but the, there, there might be a we might get a little bit creative um if, if possible but then um if it works better for us like I I'm happy to to tackle it as part of our thing because we're trying to deal with the 75 25 yeah part on the budget modification and like what should count anyway. So maybe this, they, they sort of dovetail. So mm-hmm. I'm fine with it, but it's up to Jim. He's the one who's stuck on both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I'm already came up with law schools it. kind of backwards. It, it came up because it's law schools that, that demonstrate the issue, but it isn't a law school issue. It's, it, right. it's an applicant issue. So, yeah. you yeah. know, it, it, it belongs in a lot of different places. I think the question that came up during this meeting that is really interesting is if law schools and QLSPs are providing, have significantly different overhead or indirect costs, then should they have a different percentage? My feeling is probably not, but maybe there is a case for that. And, uh, you know, I don't know what Erica or uh, Amina are thinking on that since we'll, the rest of us, I guess, will get to talk. <laughs> but wow that's that's a whole fresh can of worms all right I, all right i didn't Those even visit that aisle. <laughs> i mean but, my but inclination think... is to say no to that just because mine too but... i i i don't see that in the statute and i don't and and it it so let me say this the law school clinics i don't this may not be fair but like i I understand they need more funding, but also they're part of universities and a lot of these organizations exist yeah. on their own. And so yeah. I am I am not inclined to give law school clinics more favorable right. treatment right. Than, than the standalones. Right. right. Well, but, but just to throw in an opposite point of view. I sure, mean, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm persuadable, right? <laughs> yeah, that they're extremely important for recruitment and retention of lawyers so cool. into this field. Totally. And, yes. That's and, a very good and, point. And they are a problem in that they're organizations that are always working in with a larger organization, whereas yeah. most of our qualified providers are standalone entities. Yeah. No, it's a really, it's a great point. And I, it, it, there's a reason it's a thorny issue. Um, you know. <laughs> well, th- th- thank you all for your patience in, in, in you. helping us think through these. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim and, and Pamela and William. Uh, Yes. For your responsiveness yeah. and for helping get it to this point. And I know that you yeah. will kick it across that line shortly. Uh, Dan, but, you're uh, going gonna to come down for a victory tour in LA? Uh, that would be fun. 
if, if I do, I will certainly uh, drop a note. I'll let everybody know. But uh, it would be great to meet those of you I haven't. And um, it has absolutely been a pleasure. Yeah. Even today, this is actually, I enjoy this. This is a good conversation. We, mm, five minutes right, away. right, right. And, and still getting subsidies. So um, right. I mean, I don't want to keep anybody any longer, uh, but uh, thank you all. And you'll be hearing from us soon with some <laughs> updates and yeah. the next steps. Yeah, and I, I provided um, you guys with some guidance on this issue, but if we didn't, let me know. I'm happy to do whatever I can. And I just wanted to, um, I know you guys all got the, the email that the um, June meeting is now moved to July. July. Um, so again, thank you for your patience. I know this this committee in particular, we've had to shift around the work plan and move around meetings, but um, thank you for your flexibility because it really helps. You know, all of you are on working groups, so you know that this, this it's very time consuming. It's requiring a lot of thought and like we're getting to a good product. It's just it's just taking a little bit longer than we anticipated. So um, better to take longer and get it right. True. Oh, very true. Very true. Very true. We have a meeting in June, though, right? The commission has a meeting. The commission right. has a meeting June seventeenth. Yeah, I will be there. Yeah. I'm going. I'm coming into San Francisco. Oh yeah, you'll so you'll see staff. We'll, um, you know, yeah. we're hoping to have it set up so that like we can like be all in a conference room and Zoom between San Francisco and Los Angeles, and then everybody else that's Zooming remotely. Our offices, we, we don't know yet. We're gonna know in a week or not. But even if you come, um, you know, you, you'll see staff. Um, you might have to be put in like a, a separate conference room, separate like room. Will, and then we'll come together for lunch. But um, stay tuned. Yeah. For in a week or It'll two. be fun to see. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fun to see. Well, I will say, if they're going to just put us in separate rooms, let me know, <laughs> because I may just come back to my WeWork here. Yeah, so that, that, that's why, yeah, and we would talk it's about that. It's a long that, drive that, for me to sit in a conference. I know, room. and that, that's why we're, we want to give you all notice, because I feel like yeah. that would make a okay. difference. You all want to see each other instead of just sitting in your own. I know. We're, and we're trying with our tech. It's just, they're trying to outfit all the, um, all computers. Because you have to have computers and stuff. And everything. But it's, it's every, hard. The outfitting yeah. isn't, is it, it's, Yeah. It's, well, unless you brought your own laptop, right? It doesn't no, work. That messes it up laptop. too. It oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah our, our staff meetings have been just crazy. It's like a billion echoes. It echoes. Oh, you can't really? do that. Yeah. I Catherine, was fine in, in LA, but oh, I guess everybody, if everyone has a mic yeah. on their laptop, blah. <laughs> or Catherine and uh, yeah, Judge right. Ryan had yeah. that issue at our right, right, <laughs> meeting. Right. They're like, Yes, in the same space. <laughs> Finally, they just had to share one computer. Like, yeah, yeah it's uh, uh, they, okay. Well, thank you guys well, very much for all the work. You. This is really educational. Totally. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.